was about a week before Christmas when all through the Jesse Gender house, this creature was stirring cause JK Rowling had Twitter expoused. Look, I spent hours trying to think of a better rhyme than that. I am not a poet, damn it. My holidays were, um, a thing, let's say. I went and visited family in Buffalo, New York, which, um, if you know what was happening in Buffalo, New York around Christmas. Buffalo is among the hardest hit cities. Governor Kathy Hochul saying this storm is worse than the notorious blizzard of 1977. It was a fun time. I sadly got stuck in a single room for several days and could not visit friends like I wanted to, but I did at least have my brother's dog and he is such a little puppers. He's absolutely adorable. No oh God, hey. <laughs> Like literally, this boy had no body awareness at all. He's a huge dog who thinks he's a small dog. It's so cute. I was a pupper. But unfortunately, my holidays were somewhat overshadowed by a particular event that happened right before the Christmas time that some of you may have even heard about. It started off where all good Christmas stories start. On Twitter, and involved J.K. Rowling, the author of one of the most well-known children's book franchise and the embodiment of that weird aunt who you have to invite to parties but are kind of very uncomfortable around. And this discourse became a whole thing. Like seriously, this wasn't just contained to Twitter, as most things should probably be. It caused drama in gaming subreddits, I got written up in Buzzfeed and Forbes magazine, the latter of which, by the way, called me trans gamer in their headline, which... I love that the height of my career is me being described as trans gamer by Forbes. Hell, this conversation even got big enough that when I went home for Christmas, my stepdad, who doesn't even know how to find the start bar on his Windows XP computer, had heard about it. And yes, I did say Windows XP, which, by the way, was an upgrade for him. He'd still be on Windows 95 if I hadn't stepped in. And I bet half of you don't even know what Windows 95 even is. And the other half of you is having a Chex Quest nostalgia flashback because that's the only game your mom would let you play because she wouldn't allow you to play Doom. I'm from Chex Squadron, and I volunteer. This situation was incredibly frustrating, especially for me, the person kind of at the center of it, along with Rowling, because I was drawn back into thinking about Rowling herself. It started to get me thinking about how I'm frustrated that every single conversation about trans people and trans rights often centers on her or other individuals like Matt Walsh or Dave Chappelle, how these are the people that get to control the rare moments where trans rights are discussed, how mainstream media centers conversations around trans people around controversies with these figures rather than on trans people's own words words on our own terms, and how trans people, as well as anyone else who gets caught up in it, have to put aside everything to deal with someone else's nonsense Twitter bullshit. My week before Christmas, when I wanted to not be stirring at all, was spent dealing with the harassment and during all the conversations that had been set off by JK Rowling's tweet, and how at the moment where this conversation galvanized around me for a 72 hour news cycle, then moved beyond me, how it became indicative of something much more extensive than me. It's kind of a weird thing to have a conversation about Rowling, one that I didn't start because it existed well before me, and to have it in part for a moment be centered on something that I said in a silly tweet. And then it's even weirder to watch it move beyond me while still referencing me, but as a sort of thing to be consumed, the little ideas of what I said that were pulled away rather than the totality of what I wanted to express. It's something that I've never felt on this enormous a scale before. I, it was a bizarre, surprising, kind of hopeful at times, terrifying and wild experience. So there's a lot to talk about. Some things revolve around me personally, such as the harassment and dehumanization I received, as well as the kind and loving support from many of you out there. But it also sparked a larger conversation around the Harry Potter franchise and boycotts of media, as well as Rowling's anti-trans views and her privilege, and beyond that, about wider trans people's rights and much more. And it was emblematic of a larger issue that I've discussed before on this channel regarding how the media and our culture engage with discussions of trans and human rights. And so I wanna break all of this down and analyze it. I want to talk about how I got to see firsthand how a story gets told about me without actually fully listening to what I have to say and what that story told using my own words say about how media and manufactured discourse not only desire but actively encourage a lack of engagement with actual activism and instead suggest passivity, even if it frames it in terms of whether you should choose to do something or not. And on top of all of this, 
I want this video to hopefully be the last Rolling Centric video that I ever do because I am sure as hell done talking about this lady. So I'm going to use this chance to say literally everything I care to say about JK Rowling. Like literally everything. Like we're gonna talk about PS2 Hagrid up in here. It's gonna be a, I was gonna say a fun time, but let's just say it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a time. So knock your time turners off their shelf cause we're gonna try and figure out what the hell Pure Think is. Hey everyone, so before we get rolling, sorry, had to do it, but anyways, before we get rolling, um, I just wanted to say a couple quick things before we get into the meat of the video. I'll talk about this more at the end of the video, but after this video is done and out there in the YouTube world, I really want to double down on the idea of making content about finding hope in a time when many of us don't feel hope anymore especially for those of us who are made to feel like we shouldn't have hope right now. That being said, that's a scary prospect on a platform like YouTube that likes its reactive content. And forewarning here, this section is going to be a quick little call to action for Nebula. Um, but I want to be very, very clear about it. I almost didn't put this Nebula promo in this video at all because I was really wrestling with the idea of having any sort of call to action in this video considering the topic and how rough this video is going to get later on. Spoilers for that. I tell you that because I just want you to know I didn't have to put this ad in and I'm only putting it in because I really believe in it. I have really been inspired this year by things like Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube's The Prince Play, which is a work of art made by a trans woman who is doing something that she loves, making something out of passion, not in reaction to hate. That sort of stuff, I need more in my life and I want to be able to do that with my life. And Abigail's play was literally funded by Nebula and it is getting a video version distributed on their service that only you can see there. Like quite literally, that's how I'm going to be able to see the play because I'm not flying out to the UK. Do not, do not have that time nor ability. Nebula has also been really supportive of me. The content that I've made, supporting me getting that content out there and pushing back against YouTube being frustrating, let's just say, um, as well as helping me make the things that I want to make in the coming year. So they, along with all of you, by the way, and especially my patrons, want to make that very, very clear, uh, allow me and other creators to do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Like legitimately, I have tried uploading this video that you're watching right now three times, which given the export size of this video is not easy on my internet bandwidth, and I've kept getting demonetized by YouTube. Demonetized for talking about issues related to me just being who I am, which is very angering. Yay, I like not being paid for my work. Like quite literally, this video is delayed a week going up on YouTube because of monetization issues, and it's been really, really frustrating. But the video was up this entire time on both my Patreon and on Nebula. And it's why Nebula and Patreon support really does mean a lot to me. And I'm so thankful for Nebula being a streaming service platform that puts creators and what creators want to do first forward. So if you're interested in supporting creator-driven made content, as well as the things that I want to do in the coming year, then please consider the Nebula link below. If you sign up with that link with my name in it, it does actually help me out a lot. It helps support this channel directly as well as other creators on Nebula as well. And doing the ad read bit here, that link does get you 10% off annually or 1% off monthly uh, to get Nebula directly. And to spice up the deal for all you nerds out there who like my stuff for some reason, uh, I have a few videos that I filmed actually several years ago, like a video that I did on the problematic non-binary episode of Star Trek Enterprise that I was saving to release on a rainy day in case I got sick or something like that, that I'm now going to be releasing exclusively on my Patreon and Nebula because I love the videos but the production of them is sadly well behind what I can do now with my content. So I still want to get those out there for people to see because I think they're good, but uh, I'm going to be putting them on Patreon and Nebula exclusively. So you can get the Lost Jesse Gender episodes uh, over on Patreon and Nebula if you sign up with the Nebula link or on my Patreon. And I'm telling you, I'm saying all this just because I do earnestly believe in Nebula, the content that they make, the people that they support, and the fact that they allow me to have hope in the stuff that I plan to do this year and not only pay my bills, but make 
positive content that thrives, not dies, in the algorithm. So, thank you to my patrons who help directly pay my bills as well. Thank you to Nebula. And with that said, let's get on with the... Yule Ball? I don't, I don't have a good Harry Potter related transition here. On with the show. Oh, hey, sorry. I was reading a book by an author from my childhood who remains trans supportive. Can you imagine the author of Animorphs not being trans supportive? I mean, look at this cover. Look at this cover. It's the most trans fucking thing you could ever be. I too also want to be a weird alien freak monster. Some would say I already am. But sadly, we're not here to talk about the incredible awesomeness of Animorphs. We're here to talk about JK Rowling. So, since everything has to be about me, let's start by going over what happened on Twitter between Rowling and myself. Towards the end of December 2022, I tweeted a two-tweet thread, and by the way, can I just say I hope Mastodon becomes the new place after Twitter because the fact that it's called tooting instead of tweeting there is fantastic. But anyways, I made a two-tweet thread that read, quote, Hello, interwebs. Any support of the Harry Potter franchise current projects while J.K. Rowling is in charge of it and using her ongoing platform to target and also justify her continued targeting of trans people is harmful to trans people. This is, this is frantic teenage Trekkie. Uh, I guess that is kind of you. I will not begrudge anyone their love of past works or thing they already own that they take comfort in. I own the first nine movies and all seven books myself, but any support of something like Hogwarts Legacy is harmful. There you go. You asked me to make fun of you, right to your digital face. I feel I feel like a bad person now. I'm a bad person. I'm making fun of a trans person on the internet. Who am I? Who, what have I become? Now, being honest, these weren't some huge intellectual thoughts that I spent hours crafting and putting into a script for all of you. No, these were tweets that I made just lying in bed one night before I fell asleep dreaming of having sugar plums dance in my head. And Keanu Reeves. My Christmas dreams are weird, okay? Don't judge. Anyways, these tweets just represented something that had been in my mind since a recent showcase for Hogwarts Legacy that had come out a few days before. For those of you who haven't heard of it, Hogwarts Legacy is a game that has been getting a lot of attention because it does seem like the Harry Potter game that many of us, especially those in my generation, trans people included, have always wanted. It's a chance to live out our Hogwarts fantasy. I mean, it's the game that looks to be what we all remember that Harry Potter PS2 game was, when in reality, Reality, that game was haunted by a nightmare fuel Hagrid and those goddamn stairs that kept moving when I tried to get to the next class, goddammit! Always moved at the most inopportune fucking time. These are the memories of my childhood. See? Trans people were just like you. So, I want to apologize to everybody because as I was editing this video, I realized I made a really major mistake that I need to correct. And that is the fact that I said PlayStation 2 Hagrid, when in fact I meant PlayStation 1 Hagrid. So no offense to PlayStation 2 Hagrid, PlayStation 1 Hagrid is the creepy one and PlayStation 2 Hagrid looks like this. So, so that's better. At least it's not those goddamn stairs! But, my tweet arguments break down like this. My first assertion is that J.K. Rowling continues to cause harm to the trans community and is using her platform and money as one of the most well-known writers in the world to fuel that continued harm. Why would you say something so controversial yet so brave? Unfortunately, even though this is the first premise of my tweet, even that is controversial, as it's something that not everyone believes to be true. You'll continually see people arguing that J.K. Rowling said nothing wrong or she's just standing up for women's sex-based rights and that trans people are attacking her because we really hate women. They call us gender ideology as if our existence is some sort of ideology rather than the fact that we're human beings. But we can clearly showcase that J.K. Rowling has been causing harm to the trans community in ways both large and small, essential and petty. I won't get into all of Rowling's history of transphobia, but I'll give you a few quick examples, and I'll share a few resources that go into greater detail if you're still wondering how or why Rowling has caused harm to the trans community. 
The concerns surrounding JK Rowling from the trans community started off in the late 2010s when JK Rowling liked a few tweets from noted anti-trans creators such as the late Magdalene Burns, a Scottish YouTuber who had described trans women as blackface in some of her videos and described trans activism as a men's rights movement, as well as being critical of LGBTQ rights organizations like Stonewall due to their support of trans people. Stonewall UK, acceptance without exception. Your fucking minds are so open, your brains have fallen out. Lesbians exist and this is not it. You do not represent us. You are absolute fucking treacherous, money-taking bastards. I still don't know what it means when someone says they live full-time as a trans woman, especially when they look like a bloke as well as tweeting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories around the dark money behind the transgender movement that has become more and more common in many gender critical spaces today. These tweet likes were described as slips of Rowling's fingers, a senior moment on her part. From there though, in early June 2020, JK Rowling tweeted support of Maya Forstarter, another gender critical woman in the United Kingdom who took her former employer, the Center for Global Development, to court after her contract was not renewed after she had made social media posts calling trans women men and allegedly made trans women at the CGD feel uncomfortable by stating the same things in workspaces. Maya at court argued that she was just fighting for free speech and that she was being discriminated against for her views, and after galvanizing so much attention around her became a founding officer of Sex Matters, a lobbying group that opposed transgender legal protections. She has since gone on to be one of the leading figures in the gender critical movement, and has many associations with JK Rowling as well. However, at the time in June 2020, many were angered by Rowling's support of Maya, and very soon afterwards, Rowling posted an essay that discussed her concerns about trans people. While she stated in the essay that she had a trans friend who said that everything she was saying was okay and that she believes trans people are totally valid, all right, this mainly felt like an attempt to shield herself and her talking points from criticism. And the criticism of her essay was more than fair here, as the essay spread a lot of known and debunked mis- and disinformation around trans people that was designed to be used to vilify trans people. For example, one thing she did was shared a bunk theory of rapid onset gender dysphoria, citing a poorly researched begging the question study that states that girls are made to believe that they're trans by social influence, a social contagion, as it were. The study, written by one Lisa Lightman, was heavily criticized after it came out for its flawed research and scientific practices, and Lisa Lightman herself has gone on to do further studies on things like transgender detransitions that continue the same begging the question style of sampling, where she only samples people for her studies who are already concerned with the topic that she's discussing, such as parents on message boards who are already concerned about their child exploring transgender identity for her ROGD study. These studies often come to conclusions that affirm gender critical ideology even if the study itself doesn't warrant that level of conclusion. Sadly, this type of begging the question style research has become a common tactic in anti-trans spaces using bunk science to justify anti-trans rhetoric, such as we saw in a study propped up by the BBC in a heavily criticized article that, despite the study not finding widespread evidence of trans women pressuring women into sex, as the article claimed, was written up as justification for such fear mongering about trans people. This highlights while many anti-trans movements will state that they aren't talking about all trans people, they constantly only prop up and discuss trans people in fearful terms that are meant to villainize trans people widely. Speaking of which, in her essay, Rowling mentioned that she was the victim of a sexual assault, which is absolutely horrific and never should have happened to her, and I want to be very, very, very clear about that fact. But she brings it up in the context of a essay about trans people, and there doesn't really seem to be much relevancy to why she brings it up. While she doesn't outright state this, she makes an implicit implication that these two things are related. The fact that women, cisgender women specifically, face a lot of sexual assault and the dangers of trans people potentially being let into quote unquote women's spaces. This leads to the implicit implication that trans women are inherently predatory. This is a tactic that we often see used by many TERFs and gender critical women, as well as many anti-trans groups, saying overtly that they want trans people to just live their lives in any way that they want to, but constantly only talking about trans people in relationship to when trans people might potentially cause harm and be sexual predators to women thereby framing in the mainstream discourse that trans women are a really big concern when it comes to this area, which isn't actually the case. Over the past few years since her essay, Rowling has done this exact thing more and more and more often. 
And it all stems from this first time that it appeared in her essay where she makes the irrelevant point about the fact that she is a victim and survivor of sexual abuse. This is something I spoke about more in my video on turf ideology, but how many gender critical women who fall into anti-trans rhetoric often are sublimating a specific trauma that they experience with cisgender men onto transgender people. When in reality, these things aren't relevant to each other at all. And in fact, trans women and the trans community generally often face higher rates of sexual abuse and assault. From there, Rowling shared support for anti-trans legislation and against legislation that would help transgender people, such as the Gender Recognition Reform Bill in Scotland. But her reach spread beyond the United Kingdom in the political arena, as even politicians in the United States began to cite Rowling in anti-trans legislation and talking points. After this, she also became close and tweeted public support for numerous anti-trans hate groups and leaders, such as the LGB Alliance and Alison Bailey, both of whom successfully campaigned for the removal of LGBTQ workplace protection group Stonewall from the BBC, hurting not only trans protections at the company, but protections for gay, lesbian, and bisexual, and all queer folks there as well, among numerous other issues that this group has been known for. Further, Rowling has aligned herself with people like Helen Joyce, who has written this explicitly anti-transgender propaganda and gave it the world's most boring and on-the-nose title ever, who herself attended anti-transgender protests which were organized by a woman going by the name of Parker Posey, whose real name is Kelly J. Keene Minchel. Minchel is a gender-critical feminist who has openly courted the help of far-right groups at her rallies and has worked with neo-Nazi influencers and once called for men with guns to enter girls' bathrooms to protect cisgender women against transgender women, thereby calling for men to go into women's spaces to enact violence against women. Seems a little bit hypocritical there. Um, had a bit of an idea about some of the things that you can do, and men, for once, I'm talking to you. I'm talking about you dads who maybe carry I think that's what you say. Uh, I'm so down with the American lingo. Maybe you carry, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you consider yourself a protector of women. Maybe you're that sort of man. Um, maybe you have a daughter or a mother or a wife. Uh, maybe you have a sister. Maybe you just have some friends. Maybe you just think women are human and you don't need any absolute connection with them to feel compelled to protect us. Um, I think you should start using women's toilets, men. And has also held protests and tours across the UK and the United States spreading hate against trans people. And at these protests, which again, gender critical feminists like Maya Forstarter and Helen Joyce, who Rowling surrounds herself with, attended, anti-trans attendees did violence against some of the counter protesters there to support trans people, such as when a 14 year old girl claims that she was maced by some of the anti-trans people attending the rally. Even further, as I was editing this video, at one of these rallies, a gender-critical woman who is friends with Kelly J. Keene Minchel began to quote Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf in reference to the, quote, big lie of trans women being women. Do you know the big lie? The big lie was first described by Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. The big lie is such a big lie that ordinary people like us think, well, that can't be a lie because I'd never tell any big as big a lie as that. We only lie in small ways. The big lie, well, there is one big lie going on, and it was begun by men in oh, the early part of the 20th century. It was began when they had an erotic fantasy, and they decided they were gonna sell us the big lie. And what is the big lie? The big lie is trans women are while I am often hesitant to use these sort of memeable gotcha moments when discussing fascistic undertones to gender critical movements, this one is worth mentioning. The fact that this gender critical woman was overtly and explicitly using Nazi rhetoric at a public rally against trans people is honestly very nerve wracking to see as it showcases a growing lack of desire to even subtly dog whistle the leanings of many gender critical spaces. Writer Judith Butler recently wrote a great piece about how gender critical movements and anti-trans sentiment are often used to push authoritarian and totalitarian leanings into governments, as we've seen not only in the UK and US, but in several countries around Europe. Which is what makes Rowling's association with many of the people who attend these rallies and lead them galling. But not only has Rowling associated with people who attend Minchel's rallies, 
Rowling has also tweeted support of Parker Posey and her rallies, denouncing trans supportive protesters at those events instead of the far right presences at Parker Posey's rallies. Rowling has also tweeted support of numerous anti trans and even anti abortion leaders, showing how attacking of trans rights also affects women's rights generally. Through all of this, Rowling has gone further and further down a radicalization pipeline that centers trans people as the greatest threats to women's rights, even over actual threats to women's rights. For example, numerous groups that Rowling has shared support for have also worked with right-wing groups who have also worked against women's rights. For example, Andy Ngo, who is a noted Proud Boy supporter and has ties to them, attended the LGB Alliance conference in the UK last year. For an even starker example, Rowling has spent little time discussing support for abortion access, and instead, while conversations about abortion access were going on, and on the same day that a protest against anti-trans conversion therapy was happening at Downing Street in the UK, Rowling instead attended a fancy brunch with a bunch of anti-transgender leaders, underscoring how for gender critical feminists, they aren't really focused on women's rights, they just are focused on attacking trans people while also having fancy brunches. To be fair, I do like a fancy brunch, but I also like women to have, you know, rights too. Probably a little bit more than brunch. Let's, let's say definitely a little bit more than brunch. All of this showcases how Rowling and her transphobic actions, as well as the actions of many gender critical feminists, have not only harmed trans people, but also actively distract from and harm women's and LGBTQ rights in general, and how they ultimately uphold an authoritarian viewpoint that wishes to control marginalized people's bodies. I could also even be incredibly petty about Rowling too, such as how under her Robert Galbraith pseudonym, she has written detective novels that perpetuated the stereotypically and honestly overwrote boring and outdated 30 years ago trope of the cross-dressing mentally ill serial killer who totally isn't indicative of her views on trans people, but I certainly won't have a trans person positively portrayed in my stories. See, I'm queer, I can be petty too. I mean, anyone can be petty, whether they're queer or not, but you know, I too can use bad stereotypes to propel a shitty joke. See, that was some pettyception for all of you there. That was pettiness inside of pettiness. It's like a wee little Russian doll of queer pettiness. I love it. But more recently and more importantly, Rowling recently opened a women's shelter for abused women, which earnestly and honestly, like no jokes, I hope helps many. But. In doing so, when she opened it up, she made clear that this shelter will exclude, quote, men or individuals identifying as trans women, which highlights in that wording how they are denying that being trans is even a thing someone can be, but is also just abjectly cruel to turn away trans women and anyone who needs help. It's honestly just horrible and showcases Rowling's cruelty above all else. And I say cruelty because that's what it is cruel. It's cruel to exclude a trans woman or anyone coming to you for help for a situation that Rowling herself has said that she experienced and knows how horrible it is to go through, and how much it means to have someone who you can go to to get help from. It's even more especially cruel when you note the fact that trans women are more likely to face this type of abuse. And Rowling will argue that she's excluding trans women from the shelter because she's worried of men trying to get into women's spaces. Again, subtly framing trans women as inherently predatory, despite the fact that every other shelter in the country has accepted and does still accept trans women into shelters, and there have been literally zero incidents of issues arising from this fact. So yes, Rowling's being intentionally cruel in doing this. It's cruelty built on baseless fears around trans women. But to wrap this all out, it's important to note that J.K. Rowling is doing all of this within the context of the continual erosion and attack on transgender rights and transgender people that is happening across the world, but especially in the U.S. and U.K., where J.K. Rowling's audience mainly lies. Hate crimes, violence, rhetoric against trans people, legislation against trans people, the use of stochastic terrorism against the trans community, and much more are all continually on the rise. And yet JK Rowling chooses this time to be the time that she goes after transgender people. Her attacks on the transgender community are not an isolated incident, one that we can talk about solely through the lens of just her, but must be discussed and recognized within the context of the broader attacks on trans rights that are going on right now that she is directly contributing to, especially considering the size and breadth of her platform. This is why many trans people talk about JK Rowling because she has this level of platform is using it to wield harm against a deeply marginalized and currently under attack group. And again, this was the short list. I could have gone on 
for a very long time, longer than I already did, but all of this showcases the continuing harm that rolling does. If you want to know more, I'd recommend this article on J.K. Rowling's transphobia that I wrote for GameSpot, as well as this video I did on gender critical ideology as a whole. Or, if you don't want to hear my voice anymore, you could check out these wonderful videos by YouTubers ContraPoints and Sean that go more into Rowling specifically and some of the views of those she supports. But moving on though, I bet many of you, if you haven't kept up on the Rowling discourse because you're a normal person, you may be shocked at many of those allegations that I made against Rowling. Many of you probably didn't hear half of what I was discussing. I mean, if you look up articles on websites claiming to be the entire timeline of J.K. Rowling's transphobia, you'll mostly only get people mentioning her essay from 2020 and say that it was controversial to the trans community, without any fundamental analysis of what was said in that essay or the horrific disinformation it platformed. And in those articles, you'll hear more about the Twitter drama that J.K. Rowling has caused, and not the genuine far-right-wing people that she has fancy brunches with, or the organizations she has thrown her support into. I mean, for me personally, I went to dinner with my stepbrother's family over Christmas, and they asked about my Twitter drama with Rowling because they had heard about it. And I read them literally all that section that I just told you right now because I was working on this script. And they were shocked. In fact, my stepbrother's dad continually said, No, no, that can't be true. And then I showed him the actual proof that I put up on screen for all of you. And that reaction from all of them is interesting, right? That Rowling has done all of this harm, has associated with all these people, yet most of the discourse around her has been reduced to Twitter drama. The fact that I had to spend time explaining Rowling's harm, that so many people deny that this harm even has occurred, is a point that I'm going to be returning to later on. Anyways, we've gotten far off track from my tweet, so let's talk about the second part of my tweet. In it, I described how Rowling has continued to use the platform that she has been given as the head of the Harry Potter franchise, as well as the cultural relevancy that that platform comes with, to amplify her transphobic views and the conspiracies that they're based on, broadcasting them to people who would never have heard of them otherwise. But even more importantly, and pertinently to what we're going to be discussing, Rowling proudly uses the fact that her franchise continues to sell endless amounts of money as evidence of support for her transphobic views. She's tweeted out as such, saying that her sales went up when she spoke about trans people, and that she's still being asked to make movies, TV shows, and books. Now, in reality, this correlation between her transphobic views and the sales of the Harry Potter franchise doesn't actually exist. People who financially support Harry Potter have a range of opinions on her. Some view Rowling as she sees herself, a martyr for women's rights. But many people are frankly unaware of her thoughts on trans people or even any of her ideology and just find any discussion on it to be convoluted or confusing or simply don't care. They just want to be a wizard in a Harry Potter game or play a Harry Potter board game or read whatever the hell a cursed child was, but they don't necessarily support her transphobic views. And then there are many people who do support trans rights, know that she's transphobic and still buy her stuff, which we'll talk more about in a minute. There are even some people who entirely and vocally disagree with Rowling on trans people, but still believe that buying Harry Potter merch doesn't hurt the community or trans people generally, and just want to enjoy a franchise that they really love. Yet despite the many reasons someone may support Harry Potter financially, Rowling continues to claim that her continued relevancy is a sign of support for her escalating transphobia. And this is why I said in that tweet that continuing to buy Harry Potter merchandise is harmful. My main concern is not Rowling getting more money, she's a billionaire. Even if she gets sales from residuals, the money from the game or any other Harry Potter merchandise is honestly a drop in the bucket at this point. She's going to be rich no matter what. The real issue that I have is how Rowling continues to use the Harry Potter franchise to justify her hatred and gain attention for herself. Yet, in my second tweet, I tried to make a further point because I knew that some would see the first tweet as simply me attacking Rowling. Because again, sadly, due to the lack of clear understanding of transgender issues, as well as the constant mis- and disinformation spread about us, trans people are often portrayed as the villains in discussions about her, or just in anything really. So I wanted to make a clear point that this wasn't about attacking her work or the importance that it had for many people, but discussing Rowling's continued harm. I pointed out that many trans people or those who recognize Rowling's harm still care about Harry Potter. Many of us, myself included, grew up with it. 
And while many of us can't engage with it anymore for numerous reasons, the biggest of which is being reminded that Rowling is a bigot when we try to reread or engage with the franchise, there are many who still also have Harry Potter as a cherished part of their life and their story. Many of us, especially queer folks, resonated with the tale of a wizard growing up in a closet and finally finding acceptance among those who saw him for who he was and allowed him to flourish and grow into the real power he had hitherto been forced to hide due to bigotry. And eventually he would go on to fight wizard Hitler, though not dismantling the government systems that enabled him to come into power and in some cases helped him come to power, but that's a different conversation. But hell, I love Harry Potter so much that my cat is literally named Newt after the lead of Fantastic Beasts. I stand my Hufflepuff king. Look at him. He's talking about Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. I found him. I found him. He, this is a Fantastic Beast right here. Yeah? Okay, you can go. Be free. Be free! <laughs> This is why many queer people have argued for practicing something akin to the death of the author, or separating the artist like Rowling from her work, and still love Harry Potter as a franchise despite Rowling. It's something I also argued for at the start of Rowling's transphobia years ago, but for me, today, in my personal view at this point, as Rowling continually uses the attention she gets from the continued Harry Potter franchise's popularity to prop up her transphobia, this isn't so clear-cut a possibility as with someone like H.P. Lovecraft, an extremely racist author who named his cat something much worse than Newt. It has been said that they are motivated by anxiety over influences deleterious the civilization, that is, my civilization, New England civilization. But who is now dead, and whose work is not ongoingly propping up harm directly, and has in fact often been reclaimed by the same groups and communities he worked to marginalize. So my two tweets tried to show that, while we can recognize this works meaning to us and can appreciate it privately on our own terms, especially if we already own the merch and haven't paid more money for it, the public and continued support of a franchise that is being wielded to justify and perpetuate harm isn't a neutral thing to do. So those are my tweets. And I don't know how JK Rowling found my tweets, I do have two theories. Either she was name searching herself, or my tweet had begun to make rounds in the gender critical feminist sections of Twitter that Rowling traffics in, circles where she is not only one of the most vocal and prominent people sharing anti trans gender views, but exists as a galvanizing figurehead for the anti trans movement within. But regardless, she found my tweet. And upon seeing it, JK Rowling screenshotted the second and not the first of my two tweets and then tagged me, something I didn't do to her because I'm not here to go after her as an individual, but just to talk about the situation. The fact that Rowling screenshotted the tweet, but then took the time to tag me instead of just quote tweeting me like a normal person showcases that she had an intention to directly call me out and let me know and let her followers know that she was directly calling me out. And that is important that we'll get to later. However, this was her response to my now out of context message. Deeply disappointed, Jesse Gender doesn't realize pure think is incompatible with owning anything connected with me in any form. The truly righteous wouldn't just burn their books and movies, but the local library, anything with an owl on it, and their own pet dogs. Hashtag do better. Wow, it sounds like she was being critical of Jesse Gender in that tweet. One might say she's Jesse Gender critical. Look, I may be a trans woman, but I sure as hell will make dad jokes. I will cling to that male privilege. Now, I'm gonna be honest, it took me a while to figure out exactly what the fuck she was trying to say here. I mean, pure think? Ugh. Also, I'm not entirely sure how she escalated this to puppy murder because, I mean, I love puppies. Except for when he's my brother's dog waking me up at 6 in the morning and I want to yell at him, but he's just so adorable that I can't be angry. <laughs> It's honestly a wild tweet, and I'm, like, earnestly curious if she made it while sitting on her golden toilet in her literal castle at 2 a.m. And, by the way, that wasn't meant to be an insult to her, because that's how I do most of my tooting, except for replace the golden toilet and castle with a tiny-ass toilet with tiny pipes that constantly clog in my small Seattle apartment that still can't get me a dang plumber in here. But know this! I tweet a lot of my thoughts on the toilet. All of you Twitter followers of mine, you're reading my toilet thoughts. And I'm sure we've also had a fair few of Rowling's crap tweets as well. 
Anywho, parsing out her argument here, pure think is a sort of pseudo Orwellian term that she came up with on the spot. It's the idea that she's trying to push that trans rights are an ideology that requires everyone to be pure, that no one can disagree with trans and gender ideology. And from that assertion that she's making, she then also says that since her literature is seen as anti-trans, that this requires a sort of fascist type book burning on our part, and also us to kill anything associated with her, which I guess means owls and puppies. So this argument is a lot because it ignores so much. First off, trans people are not an ideology, we're people that exist. And as a result, not all of us are in agreement with each other. Even within spaces that support trans people, there's a lot of disagreement on what trans means, how our community can and should identify, and what we wish to do to fight for our own rights. Hell, we're also incredibly diverse as people. The trans community is just as diverse as the entire human population because we're a part of every community as well as our own. There is no pure think required to be part of the community. In fact, as I articulated mere moments ago, there are many people in the trans community who still wish to hold on to JK Rowling's books and cherish them despite Rowling's transphobia. The only part of being part of the trans community is that you be trans, and all of us only really argue for self-respect and human rights for all trans people. But by framing this argument, Rowling is concocting a boogeyman trans person that exists only in her head. And she does this to convince her audience that trans people are the people who are really controlling and dominating the conversation. That we require everything that isn't in alignment with our thought to be burned and also, again, murdering puppies. Still can't, I, I literally can't get, get over that, that it like went to murdering puppies, wild. But this is a pervasive anti-trans talking point, one that I've discussed numerous times in numerous different areas on this channel. Go to any comment section talking about trans issues, trans rights, or discussing someone's transphobia, and you'll invariably find people there saying, why can't you just have a difference of opinion? You're trying to control what we do. That's fascist, you see. It's funny how fascists call people fascists. It's not possible to change your gender. There are only two, man and woman, deal with it. You are delusional and have a mental illness. Reality will always win. It's time to grow up and stop trying to push your ridiculously childish views on people. Facts do not care about your feelings. I hope this makes you mad because you need to learn that feelings don't matter in this little place called reality. I have a question. Why is it the trans doesn't give the opposing view the same acceptance that they so rightfully ask for? How are trans people being targeted by JK Rowling or indeed anyone? It's an alarmingly authoritarian ideology in which people seem to just believe everything they read and do no research. Take professional shouty man Tucker Carlson saying this, that trans people are the ones in power because we say you can't say anything against us. Because in fact, the Second Amendment is not the freedom that threatens the people in charge the most. No, that would be the First Amendment, which is your right to say what you sincerely believe. That is the right, the first in our Bill of Rights, that terrifies them the most. Your words are a greater threat than any firearm. They must censor you or else they lose power. It is that simple. Now that seems implausible, and yet many are making this claim. Many have made it. This is not what trans people are saying. What we're saying is that maybe you don't go on and say hate speech on, you know, a big platform. This is a common refrain though in anti-trans bigotry and one that I see quite often. That trans people are just trying to put down people sharing a difference of opinion, when that difference of opinion is literally our right to exist. Transphobia is not a difference of opinion. What it is, is unacceptable. I was saying numerous times when I first suggested a boycott of Rowling's properties years ago. I received numerous comments and messages telling me that I was trying to control people by telling them what to do regarding the game. I'm buying Hogwarts Legacy. Fuck all of you who think you can tell me what to do with my money. I like the look of the game. I don't care if the goal of the game is to kill all the wizard babies or something. It looks sick. If I buy anything Harry Potter, it is because I support my happiness. What I'm showing by buying Hogwarts Legacy is, you don't get to tell me what to do with my money. The end. Tweets like that last one showcase how this feeling comes from the conspiratorial idea generated by folks like Carlson and spewed by Jake and Rowling as well. Primarily that trans people are trying to exert control over everything. We have the real power here. There's a conspiracy at work. Trans people have an agenda. Control not only what you're allowed to say, but what you're allowed to think. Again, very Orwellian. Yet this conspiratorial thinking ignores, one, that my only secret cabal intention myself is to make you a Trekkie. I will link you to my hive mind of pre-evolved salamander people. Tuvix did nothing wrong. I'm flesh and blood. And I 
have the right to live. And two, I'm not telling you what to do, say, or think, and no trans person is. You can do whatever you want. What I am telling you is what it would mean and what it might symbolize to trans people around you. And I know I already stated this, but it is very important to point out that I am not ubiquitous in this feeling about Rowling and the Harry Potter franchise. And that's really important and cool, actually. Well, I certainly have my viewpoint on Rowling and the franchise, and I do believe and am arguing for this point of view, it's important to recognize that there is no ubiquitous thought on this, and that it is something that we are all struggling with. But that I am not trying to dictate or force anyone to feel my way, just making my argument about it. And hopefully can persuade you in the articulation of it. I'm not saying that you can't, but that you shouldn't. Which is a very important distinction. Also, and we'll talk more about this later on in this video, but this comparison is also particularly insulting to trans people considering Nazi book burnings were done particularly against LGBTQ and trans supportive people and works. For example, one of the first Nazi book burnings was caused by a raid against the Institute of Sex Research led by Magnus Hirschfeld in Germany in 1933. The Institute's library and archives were literally put on the streets and burned in front of members of the Institute, and many people themselves were attacked and assaulted. Up until that point, the Institute of Sexology was one of the leading research centers in the world for transgender individuals. So for Rowling to equate book burning to supporting trans people not only showcases her ignorance of transgender issues, but is mildly offensive. I say ignorance, by the way, because one could understand why Rowling would reach for this analogy, considering that when her book were coming out, many right-wing folks and Christians decided to burn her books because it seemingly promoted the devil because it had witchcraft in it. But what she doesn't seem to realize is that the same people that were burning her books just a few decades ago are the same people now calling for her to be praised because she is going after trans people, not the other way around. Well, there's a false dichotomy if I've ever heard one in my life. You have to choose between those two things, either Harry Potter or quote-unquote trans women. You, can't, it's the, you have to choose between them. Now, um, and you can see in the video here, one of the uh, book burnings happening. Um, now, why are people mad at J.K. Rowling? Well, this goes back, of course, to the controversy that Rowling stirred up months ago when she first came out as a believer in biology. This is a very stressful and dangerous thing for any celebrity or anyone who runs in left-wing circles. To be exposed as a biology believer can have serious consequences in their lives. This should be a cancellation that I'm doing in 1930s Germany, not modern America, but as always, those who allegedly hate fascism have a funny habit of copying its methods. And finally, all this feeds into this narrative of the robust and nebulous enemy of society that they claim that trans people are. A narrative built to instill fear in their audience to foster resentment and anger at trans people. Yet in actuality, trans people like myself calling for a boycott are probably not even going to make a dent in rolling sales. I am under no illusions that me and other trans people and trans supportive people saying boycott Harry Potter will really move the needle significantly one way or the other. Harry Potter is a dominant franchise that continues to sell more and more despite the mediocre output of the last few years. Harry Potter cash grab mobile games, for example, online, despite them being utter crap, made $1 billion this year, the biggest ever for them. This is ultimately why this whole idea of me saying it's a marketplace of ideas doesn't really work. While I am making my argument and trying to get it out there, Rowling has the money and power to keep going regardless, and to be heard more. She's going to always have the bigger platform, and it sadly doesn't matter how much I push back or argue this point on Twitter or elsewhere. Merchandise is going to sell, and trans people's rights are still a controversial, poorly understood topic, and not one that many people are going to die on the hill of, besides, you know, trans people who are being killed. As I said before, many people aren't even aware of Rowling's views or how harmful her actions are. But people were thinking that me calling for a boycott was me actually thinking that it was going to stop the sales and ruin the game. People were laughing at me saying, good luck with that. But I'm realistic. I know that the boycott won't be the most successful thing ever, but it doesn't mean that it's not an argument worth making, nor a stance worth defending. A line in the sand worth making and explaining why. Yet, Rowling's take is even more frustrating than what I just depicted, because she's ignoring the real trans person, myself, right in front of her, making the argument that, hey, it's okay to have a meaningful relationship with problematic material. And I'd say that while my feelings are not ubiquitous within the trans community, I say my point is more representative of the struggle that many trans people who have grew up with Harry Potter feel. That we want to hold on to what we care about even in the face of her harm. I'm literally right in her tweet making that argument that she is ignoring for her stereotypical boogie trans person. 
It's basically her saying, excuse me, I was having an argument with the straw man version of you, not you. Please, please align with my straw man version. It ignores the genuine frustration many of us feel at this work of art that meant so much to us being wielded by someone actively attacking our community. It ignores the experience that so many trans people have with our families and friends who still adore Harry Potter. Take, for example, what happened with me over Christmas these past few weeks. Like I mentioned before, I attended a Christmas party with my stepbrother's family, and my stepbrother's girlfriend, who adores Harry Potter to death, got a Hufflepuff sweatshirt as a gift. But as she opened it, everyone in the family looked awkward, and I knew, sitting there, that everyone only felt this discomfort because I was in the room. If I wasn't there, the gift would have been opened without any problem, and the only reason I was there was because I got stuck there because of the Buffalo Blizzard. They would have all just had this gift, opened it, and it wouldn't have been a thing. But the very fact that I was there, when I wasn't expected to be, made them all instantly realize how uncomfortable this gift was. And as a result of this, I began to think that it was my fault for making everyone uncomfortable, when really I just happened to be there. They invited me. Simply by being a trans person in the room with them, a person that they cared about, seemed to have brought shame upon everyone, and shame to myself. In, in actuality, I just wanted this moment to get over with. I wanted my brother's girlfriend to have gotten a wonderful gift that she enjoyed regardless of the context of it. And she was someone who I've been wanting to connect with for a very long time, but I've never really been able to do so. So I, uh, the sense of awkwardness that I feel like I caused by being there feels like it just distances me from someone that I want to get to know better. And on top of that, I get it. I get why everyone would just want to have an enjoyable Christmas moment. I mean, I'd have loved to have gotten that Hufflepuff shirt if I had just been gifted a few years ago. I'm a proud Hufflepuff person. I wish I could still enjoy it now. But this is what happens. It's not like trans people are smacking Harry Potter merchandise out of people's hands, but it has a lot to do with people who do buy the merch knowing that there is a problem, but trying to enjoy it anyways. It makes us the bad guys for being aware. It makes us the bad guys for simply being present as the people she's attacking, and thus make others feel uncomfortable by our existence around them because someone else is causing harm to us. Even on top of that, even if we struggle with it, even if we want to still enjoy Harry Potter, I also spent much of my Christmas break going through the final boxes in the basement of my mom's old home, and all these old toys that I found, and a lot of them or of Harry Potter figures. Some of these, right here. <sighs> Looking at all of them, I wish I could keep them alongside the treasured Bionicles that I found with them and my tons of Animorph books. But I knew that that was a part of my childhood that I had to let go, move on past. It ignores that this is the struggle that many trans people face when dealing with our friends and family and ourselves when we discuss Harry Potter and how it makes us the targets of ire, even though we did nothing wrong in this situation, other than just be who we are. Rowling ignores the dozens upon hundreds upon thousands of trans people, myself included, who continually struggle with this, who saw, before all of this stuff escalated to where we're at now, Rowling fall further and further into this rhetoric, and articulated our struggle with seeing someone who we looked up to fall down this path. How we never wished to see her as the enemy, how we begged and pleaded and said, hey, here's some resources to learn what the actual truth is. How we wanted to stand up to a friend first, as Dumbledore himself taught us to do. Dear J.K. Rowling, From the moment my father read me the first line of the Harry Potter series, you made me believe that magic is real and can fight real monsters like discrimination, hatred, and oppression. I was enthralled in your wonderful wizarding world, which is why, as an LGBT person, it continually hurts to be shown that I'm not a part of it. I hope you understand that it's difficult for me to say all this to you. I've looked up to you as a role model all my life, and your work has continually inspired and informed so much of my sense of morality. But as Dumbledore himself once said, it takes a it great, takes a deal, great deal, of deal of bravery to stand, to stand up to your enemies, but a great deal more to stand up to your friends. I may sound angry, but I'm not. We know you're an ally to our community, and many of us appreciate all that you've done out here in the Muggle world. I know I do. I just wish I had a chance to see someone like me get their Hogwarts letter, 
because maybe that means that mine is coming one day. Maybe I too can be magical. Sincerely, a proud queer Hufflepuff. Jesse Earl. It showcases how, with many anti-trans talking points, the people spreading them are often not even aware of what the actual trans community is talking about or how we're dealing with stuff like this, but are either creating and generating disinformation around us to create a boogeyman, or they themselves have just fallen into believing the disinformation themselves and continue to disseminate it as well. But. Even in that, even though I'm aware that what she's done is just fallen into a radicalization pipeline that frames trans people as the villains, it still doesn't stop the fact that she is now doing the generating herself. I mean, she's literally claiming that trans people kill puppies. I've said that as a joke, but like, the fact that she even thinks that that's an okay thing to say about a marginalized community that is continually attacked? What the fuck? She's ignoring the trans people right in front of her making the other argument. <laughs> It's as if I was force-fed Polyjuice Potion by Tucker Carlson to turn into Voldemort and then Imperius to dance in front of Rowling for his amusement. I try desperately to tell her it's me, but all she sees is a noseless Ray Fiennes. But even moving beyond this vilification and strawmanning of the trans community, what is even more revealing in these tweets to me beyond that problem is the privilege of the worldview showcased by Rowling's tweets. That she owns owls. She used owls as a considerable part of her franchise's iconography, and because that is something that is associated with her in a small way, and that she has become so well known of a figure that she's become almost ubiquitous when it comes to children's media, that it means owls must be some way intrinsically culturally associated with her always, and therefore antithetical to trans thought. This is a ridiculous notion, obviously, and it's kind of a heightened over-the-top example, but it does hold a weird kernel of truth in it. It showcases an immense sense of privilege that she hasn't analyzed, that she is feeling she has owed something by being associated with it and being so well known. After rolling through these tweets, I got a lot of people harassing and arguing with me in emails, tweets, and DMs, and I'll talk more about that later, but one argument that interested me the most was the argument that I was somehow attacking Rowling by arguing that people shouldn't buy Hogwarts Legacy. Jesse Gender was harming Rowling's bottom line. The money she'd get off Hogwarts Legacy was threatened. So you launch an attack on a person, their income stream, and the income of everyone involved in the project, but they cannot retweet you and critique your comments? And you're not some rando, you've got more than 99% of Twitter users. Stop making yourself the victim, you're not a victim here. She said nothing wrong, you guys are raising an inquisition. Everybody who doesn't agree with your views is hunted down by a cancel mob. People like you burned witches in medieval times. <laughs> you should be ashamed. I get a bunch of these messages, and it's one that Rowling herself expressed. That not buying her merchandise is an equivalent to an attack on her. An attack on her free speech or bottom line. The money and revenue that she is owed by being the person who owns the Harry Potter franchise. And this is something we often see with many anti-transgender groups. I spoke, for example, in this video about the anti-trans leader and author Julie Bindel, who argued that she had lost her free speech and had suffered an attack on women's rights because her book wasn't published. I know firsthand the hypocrisy of publishing houses who seem to have no problem selling books by everyone from drug dealers to murderers and indeed delighted basking in the promotional opportunities they afford, but who draw a line at female authors who have done nothing more than speak out in support of women's sex-based rights. Two years ago, having produced a proposal as well as a sample chapter of my book on modern feminism. I was wooed by three separate publishing houses, wined and dined by their representatives, and told that they were desperate to be the ones to take it to market. Yet, when they subsequently took it to their acquisitions department, all were each told the same thing by the virtue signaling hipsters with beards and their blue fringed colleagues that they would leave their jobs in protest if they dared to publish a book by transphobic Julie Bindel. 
they all caved in, leaving me to sink into a deep depression from which I struggled to emerge. After years of being deplatformed at university debates, disinvited from events at the last minute, and often requiring a police escort at those I am allowed to attend, this felt like the final nail in the coffin of free speech, reason, and women's rights. The implication here is that Julie Bindel is owed a platform to speak at colleges and to have her books published. That free speech to her is to be platformed. Yet in actuality, free speech is not the right to be platformed. Free speech is the ability to say what you want, free from government intervention. It is not a platform or a book deal. You are not owed a career making money off the kind of hate Bindel sells, or owed a career in anything, really. But this is again an anti-trans tactic. To frame the perpetualization of their platform and their ability to sell more merchandise or, more importantly, garner more attention from themselves with that platform as a right that they are owed. It's an argument that we continually see in much of conservative media. People like Matt Walsh, Ben Shapiro, Tucker Carlson, Donald Trump, Dave Chappelle, and many, many others often claim their free speech is being attacked because they are being critiqued and can't speak at colleges or in specials without criticism. But in actuality, they can say whatever they want but that doesn't mean they should be given a megaphone. And what's even funnier though, is that often their bottom line or their ability to be platformed isn't even really being taken away at all. Walsh, for example, still gets college gigs and has a huge YouTube audience despite violating their policy against sexualization, as well as his endless transphobic content. Trump can sell tons of NFTs to grift his unwilling followers. Chappelle still sells out shows and hangs out with the former richest and currently most egotistical man alive. Eli. Bindle herself, after complaining about the fact that her book wasn't published and how much it was an attack on free speech and women's rights, actually had her book published. In fact, my story had a happy ending. My agent was then contacted by a male publisher at Little Brown, which published the book last year. It has since sold extremely well, vindicating their decision. Despite all of her essay's whining claims about being silenced, and Rowling still sells millions and millions of books, as she points out. And despite her failing movie series, which is certainly not fantastic, <laughs> oh, uh. Warner Brothers still wants to be in the Harry Potter game, sometimes with literal games like Hogwarts Legacy. In fact, this whole transphobia stuff probably has given her more attention in sales than she'd gotten for any of her recent novels like Casual Vacancy or her Robert Galbraith series since Harry Potter ended. Speaking on her Robert Galbraith books, the book that garnered the most controversy for being transphobic was the one that happened to sell the most books, almost double the initial amount of her debut novel in the series. Same with people like Matt Walsh, whose channel on relevancy went up after his anti-trans scree that he went on in 2022, after he claimed that he was being attacked and going after the trans woke mob, or how Julie Bindel herself only found relevancy and ability to be published after she claimed she was being silenced. Which is interesting, isn't it? It's almost as if claiming to be attacked while selling more merch at the same time gets you more attention and money and power. But we'll talk about that later. So where does this feeling of persecution come from? Well, let's continue with Rowling. This is in large part is because she feels accustomed to her revered status. She has million dollar homes, plural, she's a billionaire, and she constantly has attention thrown on her at every single word that she says. On top of that, she's feel like she's earned this wealth and status. She sold all those books and was renowned as one of the best children's authors of all time. Intricately, perfectly designed universe. I think it's very easy to forget that at the time people were talking about like the death of reading. I just think it's a beautiful creative outlook on life. This belief in limitless possibilities. One of the many reasons I admire JK so much is that millions now read books who would never have lifted a book up in their lives and you suddenly realize the power of writing. There's also discussion to be had of how she was the first billionaire to lose that status because of what she had donated to charity, which is certainly admirable. 
though her PR team has certainly kept it close to the vest if she's still a billionaire once more, showing how her giving certainly hasn't hurt her overall wealthy status, and it certainly also doesn't erase the harm that she's done in other areas, and even, as we saw with her abuse shelter for cis women excluding trans women, can often come at the expense of continuing stigmatization and ostracization against a marginalized group. Yet this charity giving all goes to this viewing of Rowling as a perfect pure saint who can do no wrong. And it becomes about the fact that she feels she is owed the purchase of her goods by us because of how great she's told she's been. That she deserves it because of how intrinsically good she is. When she released the initial Harry Potter book, she was celebrated as an amazing author, a once in a generation writer. And this feeling about her exists to this day. Many expressing support for Rowling after our tweets shared this sentiment. To better. Better. Better than being one of the best-selling authors of all time. Better than founding a kid's charity. Better than standing up for women's rights at a huge personal cost. Better than funding a rape crisis centre. You're joking, of course. Miss Rowling's stories will be told for the rest of her life, and much beyond. She will be referred to as an all-time great children's author. When we all fall beyond the veil, these arguments will be forgotten. Her books will live forever. The legacy is intact, that's for sure. From a very rich children's author to one of the greatest heroes of our time, there aren't many of them. That's how her reputations change for people who actually listen to what she says. JK Rowling, I am buying Hogwarts Legacy and paying into anything that is in the wizard world. I absolutely love it and it got me through some hard times, but I also support your ideologue of women's rights. I support you and love you. You are my fave author. Thank you. Heart. This is often a line you see when trans people criticize Rowling or any transphobic figure. It's a line of defense used to hold up the purity of a person being seen as canceled by the group that is in turn being vilified. Also, I only found this after I was editing this video, but one of those tweets was from Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson was coming to Rowling's defense in spite of me. Ah, oh, oh, that's funny for some reason to me. But going back to the beginning of her career, as Rowling's book sales started to grow more and more, she started to believe this line of thought, that she was a perfect creator. Because everyone, literally all of popular culture, was saying it at the time. This formula is the same. Here she's created this world that it's is fully surprising. formed, and, and she had the idea for all seven books as it's supposed to be in her head at the start. It's, it's, it's so formula, but it's, it's one big story go. more than it's a repeating formula. Right. She's very, I, I liked her a lot. She's funny, she's very level-headed, she's very unpretentious. Um, she has a very good sense of humor about herself. At the same time, she knows exactly what she wants to do with these books. Um, you know, she knows how they started and where she wants to go with them, all of that. Well, not everyone was actually saying it. Many, at the time the books were being released, pointed out issues with Rowling's writings. Criticisms like the lack of representation within her books and how what was there was often incredibly stereotypical, not researched, or offensive. For example, the character of Cho Chang, one of the few Asian characters within the book's name, was a mix of Korean and Chinese names. Just someone grabbing a few random Asian sounding names without any awareness of what they meant or their cultural implications. One of the few black characters in the story is named literally Shacklebolt. On names alone, she, she has a wonderful way yeah. with names. Yeah. Um, or further, how goblins within her books often use anti-Semitic stereotypes, like greedy bankers who care only for their gold rather than actually helping others around them. The character of Griphook, who is the only goblin who we really get to know within the series, literally abandons Harry Potter at the end of the seventh book because he wants to protect his gold. This problem would get further compounded by the film versions of Harry Potter, with the goblins there being almost dead ringers for anti-Semitic propaganda from World War II era Germany or even older anti-Semitic conspiracy theory documents that predate the Nazis, such as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. More than likely, both the books and the film's anti-Semitic leanings towards the goblins weren't something that were consciously thought of, but showcase a lack of self-analysis on the part of Rowling and other creators about what stereotypes they were drawing from and where they had history within. We could also talk about the criticism of how Rowling wrote house elves not only as an enslaved race, but appearing to want to be enslaved, eventually needing to be taught by those in power what freedom actually means. Or we could talk about how Rowling seems to have disdain for characters like Hermione in the books when she becomes a vocal, outspoken human rights fighter who is considered to be morally correct and yet looked down upon and made fun of by her friends for doing it the wrong way because she's too uppity and too vocal about it. 
All these showcase not an active hatred or bigotry often, though it can be indicative of that, but more clearly underscore a person without awareness or knowledge of the communities that they wish to talk about or the experiences of them, but who refuses to do actual research in figuring out what the lived experience of people in these communities are and believes that they have the right or ability to do so without asking. And as a result, not only make offensive caricatures in their work, but bungle the depictions of the institutions and systems that they intend to discuss in their work. Which we can certainly see in Rowling's case. Take for example what my friend Princess Weeks discussed in a recent video. How the Harry Potter books trying to equate pure blood supremacy to racism within their narrative is filled with issues considering that while a muggle-born like Hermione faces individual stigma, she is often not systemically harmed like black people are. Speaking on gender, there is an even subtler issue in Rowling's depiction of gender in the Harry Potter world as well. We learn in the first Harry Potter book that Hermione can enter the boys' dormitory without worry, going into Harry and Ron's room. But when the boys try to go to the girls' dorms, the stairs literally turn into a slide when they magically detect the boys have a penis, I guess? Is the magic in Harry Potter gender essentialist too? I don't know. But the implication here is that girls can be trusted to go into boys' rooms, but boys cannot be. It frames this idea as men as predators from the start, even before puberty. This is a very common view in the Western world of a binary gender norms of women cannot ever be predatory or even desire sex, but boys always desire sex. They are always predatory. But this depiction of gender in the books is even more interesting in light of how Rowling has continually framed her fear of predatory men or trans women being predatory within her transphobia. Also, as a tangent, but somewhat related to what we're talking about with rolling and transgender issues, it's worth noting the depiction of Umbridge also highlights another theme in Rowling's work, a disdain for traditional femininity. The cutesy cats and pink frills of Umbridge or the bright skirts of the unwedded and manipulative Rita Skeeter and both women's noted unattractiveness is equated with their villainy often. Yet stereotypical mothers who are settled at home and even die in self-sacrifice for their child are often venerated as heroes in the franchise. All this mixed with Rowling's constant disdain for Hermione's vocal feminism within her work, sort of equating Hermione to doing feminism the wrong way quote unquote and leaving it to Harry to act actually get it right and do it the right way as we see in later books in the series after he's learned a lot from Hermione's ideology but not her actions, often highlights a hatred on Rowling's part or at least a disdain of femininity within power structures, while at the same time venerating biological reproduction and traditional roles for women as at home. This even gets mixed up directly with gender non-conforming women with the character of Tonks in the Harry Potter franchise, something that was articulated by non-binary writer Aja Romano. I vividly remember the visceral excitement I felt the first time I read the fifth Harry Potter book in 2003 and met Nymphadora Tonks, a shapeshifter with spiky pink hair, a punk rock aesthetic, and an insistence on being called by her gender-neutral last name. I was certain that Rowling had written a canonically gender-fluid character. Like missions of other Harry Potter fans who dared to project ourselves into the books, I was ultimately disappointed. By the end of the series, Tonks was a married, pulley binary woman, softer and gentler, letting her husband feminize her as Dora, a name she'd previously hated. I've always wondered if Rowling set up Tonks to somehow be tamed in the later books, from her earlier non-binary presentation in Order of the Phoenix, and I've always written it off as a surely not conscious. As a sickening byproduct of Rowling's transphobic screen on Wednesday, I now realize I was right to have been wary all along. Rowling argues in the essay for the scientifically flawed and emotionally abusive narrative that gender dysphoric teens will grow out of their dysphoria, and uses herself as an example of a teen who felt, quote, mentally sexless, before eventually, fortunately, growing out of feeling confused, dark, both sexual and non-sexual. I read this passage as a chilling, heartbreaking confirmation that Rowling wrote Tonks not as an affirmation, even a subconscious one, of trans identity, but as a conscious repudiation of it. She deliberately created Tonks as a dysphoria individual so that the character could grow out of her dysphoria, subtly perpetuating the transphobic narrative that gender dysphoria is a choice. She consciously created the shape-shifting non-binary character who helped me figure out, well into adulthood, that I was genderqueer and then made her grow into being cisgender. 
The movies themselves reinforce this reading of Tonks, subtly. See how in movie 5, Tonks was introduced to the very queer lesbian trans woman aesthetic, with purple hair and a goth look. Yet by the 8th movie, where she dies, she has a very housewife appearance, domesticated then killed alongside her husband Remus Lupin, a man who Rowling herself said was coded as gay, with his werewolfism being coded as HIV, something Rowling stated numerous times was her intention with the series. But about that. If werewolves are a metaphor for AIDS, then the fact that there is a werewolf named Fenrir Greyback who intentionally sets himself up to turn into a werewolf around children to turn them into werewolves feeds a hell of a lot into homophobic narratives around predator gay men preying upon children to turn them gay. These are narratives that existed a lot around homophobia, but it also reflects the same narratives we see rolling today espousing explicitly about children being turned trans by older trans people. It's all the same thing, the same systems, and it's inherent in her work and her intentions behind the series. However, the fact that these issues existed within Harry Potter as a franchise is not in and of itself evidence that Rowling was a huge bigot or hated Jewish people or black people but more so showcase once again that the limited viewpoint in Rowling's writings existed long before her fame, and underscore her lack of attempts to address or analyze these issues as she continued to expand on her series, even despite the fact that people were trying to get her to address these criticisms. This privileged feeling that she should and could continue these harmful storylines despite people explaining how they were harmful displays that she holds her own opinion higher. She is the one who decides what is offensive or not. These criticisms were made when the books were coming out, not just recently. But just because people weren't listening at the time doesn't mean that people weren't speaking out. But often, because these issues are being talked about by people of color, Jewish folks, or others, they were routinely ignored or pushed down. Just like the many trans people like myself who were willing to help Rowling understand her harm today but found that she wasn't willing to listen to us, many back then were ready not to hate Rowling for these issues in her writing, but point them out in hopes of her hearing and listening to them in an attempt to make them better as the series went on. This is not to excuse that these issues existed. These were things that could and should have been addressed by an editor or by Rowling herself before the books even went to print. And I'm not here to forgive the anti-Semitic or racist tropes in her art. That's not my place. But to point out the fact that many were willing to help to make the series better as it got more and more popular and work with Rowling as she wrote them. The deeper issue was that she believed she could press on and knew better than those who were from these communities who raised concerns. Rowling believed that she could do it on her own, that she knew how to speak about these communities rather than actually listening to them. She believed that she could craft a wizarding society that borrowed from and utilized stereotypes from many cultures and remain unaccountable for any of the harmful stereotypes that she used. And we can see this privileged response not just in the books themselves, but in Rowling's response to criticism. When queer people criticized her for claiming Dumbledore was gay after the books were done without actively making him textually queer within the books, and not even doing so within her first Fantastic Beast movie when she had the chance to, her tweet response was, being sent abuse about an interview that didn't involve me, about a screenplay I wrote, but which none of the angry people have read, which is part of a five movie series that's only one installment in, is obviously tons of fun, but you know what's even more fun? Mute. Rowling even actively doubled down on some of the problematic elements of her books, denying the possible reading of anti-Semitism in the Goblin's depictions or in the Fantastic Beast movies, making it very clear that the slave-loving house elves were equated to black people in America. Or we could talk about the fact that Rowling used indigenous American cultures for the creation of her American wizard school in her Fantastic Beast movies without any real analysis of the cultural appropriation that that represented. Or even that within the work she never acknowledged how this reflected real world American imperialism against indigenous American cultures through its numerous acts of violence, be it physical, political, cultural, and systemic, against these different cultures. Or we could talk about the fact that she has several different wizarding schools for European nations, and yet only one wizarding school for places like Japan or all of Asia. We could also talk about the cruel anti-fatness that she displays, not just in the Harry Potter books, but continually to this day in her Robert Galbraith series. We could also talk about her role for Nagini within the Fantastic Beast movies, making the literal snake monster the only Asian representation we get in the entire film. And the fact that Nagini is an Indonesian woman, then played by a South Korean actress, whose destiny is to be beheaded by Neville? That's kind of fucked up. Many of the best authors make mistakes, but many of the best writers seek to grow and improve by listening to criticisms of their works. 
For example, one of my favorite fantasy authors of all time, Ursula K. Le Guin, accidentally created a patriarchal wizard school in her Earthsea books, an entire world where only boys were taught to become wizards. Uh, no, the, the Earthsea books as feminist literature are a total, complete bust from my own archetypes and from my own cultural upbringing. I couldn't go down deep and come up with a woman wizard. Maybe I'll learn to eventually, but when I wrote those, I couldn't do it. Decades later, Ursula K. Le Guin realized that this was a problem, especially as she herself was a noted feminist. I had to think, now why have I put men at the center of the books almost entirely? And the women are either marginal or in some way essentially dependent on the men. It was important to think about privilege and power and domination in terms of gender, which was something that fantasy had not done. And so she actually wrote the book in the Earthsea series to address this exact criticism. It's an entire book about what it means for a woman to exist in a patriarchal wizarding world when she herself has wizardly powers. It's a great book and one of my favorites in the series, and it's directly about Ursula K. Le Guin confronting her own problems in her writing, something that Rowling continually refused to do. If women had power, what wouldn't men be but women who can't bear children? And what would women be but men who can? Ha! When Tanar, and presently with some cunning, she said, Haven't there been queens? Weren't they women of power? A queen's only a she-king, said Jed. She snorted. I mean, men give her power. They let her use their power. But it isn't hers, is it? It isn't because she's a woman that she's powerful, but despite it. What is a woman's power then? She asked. I don't think we know. What has a woman power because she's a woman? With her children, I suppose? For a while? In her house, maybe. She looked around the kitchen. But the doors are shut, she said. The doors are locked. Because you're valuable. Oh yes, we're precious. So long as we're powerless. But if you want to move beyond women authors, we could talk about one of my favorite authors of all time, Neil Gaiman. His Sandman comics are easily my favorite comic series of all time, but they are far, far from perfect. While the Sandman comics did feature many LGBTQ characters that were extremely progressive for the 1980s and 1990s when the comics were mostly written, many trans characters in the series ended up dead and quite often were just segmented bodies in the background of other people's stories, left discarded as a hunk of meat. This is how visually trans people were depicted within the pages of my favorite comic series of all time. Even further, the stories that did focus on trans women characters positively featured us focused only in light of our dysphoria and our trauma around it, and even had the literal gods themselves say that we weren't woman enough. While the stories were ultimately sympathetic to trans women, and one trans woman in particular got to say, screw you gods, it still was a far from perfect depiction of trans people, let alone the numerous other problems that you could find within the franchise with its depiction of different groups and Neil Gaiman's assumption of what he could say or do with different cultures that were not his own without doing the research. However, in his recent streaming adaptation of The Sandman, Neil Gaiman improved these aspects. He directly tried to update The Sandman Show to avoid some of these stereotypical depictions of trans people and other marginalized groups that existed within the comics themselves. And we know that this was intentional as he actively spoke about wanting to do just that. Now I can just look back at the whole thing and go, you know, baby Neil who wrote it had an awful lot to learn, but he did a lot right. And look at him trying all this stuff out and trying to figure out who he is. It's like watching, you know, watching you when you were a teenager putting on hats and glasses and different styles and changing your hair around, just sort of going, who am I? What do I look like? I definitely know that there are things that if I were doing them now, I would not do them like that. Um, but then, I also think you have to be allowed to make mistakes, because if you don't make mistakes, you don't do anything. And it's the fact that 
that he's willing to understand and articulate and even address the criticisms of his writing is why I'm actively excited for the adaptation of a story from the comic books that featured a prominent trans character that fell into some harmful issues surrounding the depiction of that character. I'm excited for that story because I trust Gaiman to have learned by listening to the trans community and update that story for the modern day in a way that is more representative of stories that we need today about trans people and more inclusive of trans people. If Neil Gaiman had done the opposite, had doubled down on his transphobia in recent years, I would not only not be excited about his adaptation of that story, I would look back at that comic book series, one that means so much to me, with sadness because I can see the flaws in it and understand that those are more indicative of his feelings today, instead of them being blind spots that he would grow as a writer out of. I can look back at the Sandman comics, see all the flaws and the problems with trans people and be like, you know what, I understand that these are problems, I will criticize them, but I still love Gaiman as an author and I understand what he was trying to do and he was willing to listen and to learn. And it's important to note that I'm talking about authors who had a lot of privilege that they failed to grapple with fully but still learn from. But we could also talk about many wonderful authors who were often inclusive and thoughtful from the start, like the amazing N.K. Jemsen, whose Hugo Award winning Broken Earth trilogy is not only a great look at institutionalized and systemic discrimination from a black author within a fantasy world, but also is inclusive of numerous cultures and communities like the trans community for example. As a young black girl reading a bunch of novels written by a bunch of middle-aged white dudes, there wasn't a whole lot in those stories that was speaking to me. If you, like me, are a marginalized writer, you're going to encounter some bigotry. There are people out there who need your example, who need you to go forth and fight that battle so they won't have to fight as hard. And it's worth it. You help to change the profession by your existence. It shows clear work on Jemson's part to have listened and learned and talked to those communities before she started writing about us. As well as her understanding her own point of view as a black woman and the systemic and institutional harms that black people face and putting it into a fantasy world where it is works in an equatable fashion to our own world, while also still distinctly being part of its own world as well. And moving beyond that, it's also important to note the distinctions between Le Guin and Gaiman. Gaiman is a man with immense privilege who nonetheless still managed to listen and empathize with experiences beyond his own even though he made mistakes in his initial works. Le Guin, who is much more equitable to Rowling's experience, was a woman author who worked hard to be inclusive in her writing, fighting to make sure her lead characters, like Earthsea protagonist Ged, were not depicted as a white guy in her cover art, for example, but also, at the same time, internalized a lot of patriarchal assumptions about the world in which she needed to break down in later works. But I had endless trouble with cover art. Not on the great cover of the first edition, a strong red-brown profile of Ged, or with Margaret Shoto's Irvine's four fine paintings of the Athenium hardcover set. But all too often, the first British Wizard of Earthsea cover was this pallid, droopy, lily-like guy. I screamed at the sight of him. Gradually, I got a little more clout, a little more say-so about the covers. And very, very, very gradually, publishers may be beginning to lose their blind fear of putting a non-white face on the cover of a book. Hurt sales, hurt sales is the mantra. Yeah, so? On my books, Ged with a white face is a lie, a betrayal, a betrayal of the book and of the potential reader. I think it is possible that some readers never even notice what color the people in the story are. Don't notice, don't care. Whites, of course, have the privilege of not caring, of being colorblind. Nobody else does. I have heard, not often, but very memorably, from readers of color who told me that the Earthsea books were the only books in the genre that they felt included in, and how much this meant to them, particularly as adolescents when they found nothing to read in fantasy and science fiction except the adventures of white people in white worlds. Those letters have been a tremendous reward and a true joy to me. So far, no reader of color has told me I ought to butt out or that I got the ethnicity wrong. When they do, I'll listen. As an anthropologist's daughter, I am intensely conscious of the risk of cultural or ethnic imperialism. A white writer speaking for non-white people, co-opting their voice, an act of extreme arrogance. In a totally invented fantasy world, or in a far future science fiction setting, in the rainbow world we can imagine, the risk is mitigated. That's the beauty of science fiction and fantasy. Freedom of invention. But with all freedom comes responsibility. 
This is something that Rowling continually refused to do. She continually doubled down on problems and problematic tropes that she was unwilling to examine or even acknowledge because she believes what she was being told, that she was the perfect, the best author of all time. It speaks again to that privilege that has always existed within her but got more and more ingrained by people venerating her. A privilege that is often reinforced when someone perpetuates the mythos surrounding someone, that she possesses a unique skill that others do not, instead of what most authors are, people who are growing and learning in their talent as they go through life. And because she was told this constant line of rhetoric, she was told to simply ignore the haters. And as the criticisms got louder and louder because there are more and more things to criticize, Rowling kept turning to the people who said that she was pure and perfect and could do no wrong, which invariably were more and more the people who were also sharing bigoted views, leading Rowling down a path towards a community that centered itself more and more around hate which is how she ended up joining many gender critical and turf spaces in their fancy brunches, because they are the people around her who only tell her that she's perfect and pure and wonderful, and let no criticism be brokered against her. And it's by no means a coincidence many of these people share Rowling's background as a privileged white woman in the United Kingdom, but who also wish to have access to Rowling's attention and platform by being around her. All the while, on the same day that she's having fancy brunches, people are fighting for their basic rights to live. Something that she doesn't listen to nor care about, despite how loud we are yelling it at her and wish she would be an ally in our fight. And she had every chance to be, and yet she chose not to be. It's sad, because had she chosen to grow, to listen, the legacy of her books would have probably been one that recognized the criticisms, understood that they were there and been critical of them, but understood them in a wider context about Rowling as a person. We could look back and see the flaws, but still love the work as a whole, and understand that these flaws were part of an author figuring her craft out. But now, because of who Rowling has become, we have to look back at the books not as an imperfect thing that we love, but as evidence of Rowling's more significant flaws and problems as a person, of her inability to see past her limited experience and worldview. Her reaction to all of these criticisms have honestly been childish. If you want a further discussion about the problems within the books, YouTubers Sean, Lily Sampson, Princess Weeks, and Hoots have all done excellent analyses of the Harry Potter franchise that you should check out. And each video that I'm recommending is of varying length, so pick your overlong YouTube video essay poison but they're all freaking great. But the most significant point to make about Rowling here when it comes to her privilege is how it's reflected within the series' ideology as a whole. How her series often recognizes superficially how an institution like the Ministry of Magic can ultimately enable fascism without understanding what that means if you're going to talk about that. Take Dolores Umbridge in this series, for example, a woman who is willing to uphold and perpetuate fascism because she seeks to maintain her own personal power, calling all those around her liars when speaking up and critiquing her. Now oh, let me make this. Quite plain. You have been told that a certain dark wizard is at large once again. This is a lie. It's not a lie. I saw him. I fought Detention, him. Detention, Mr. Potter. So according to you, Cedric Diggory dropped dead of his own accord. Cedric Diggory's death was a tragic accident. It was murder. Voldemort killed him. You must know that. Enough! And she does all of this ostensibly in the name of upholding the Ministry of Magic's power. The Ministry of Magic has always considered the education of young witches and wizards to be of vital importance. Progress for the sake of progress must be discouraged. Let us preserve what must be preserved, perfect what can be perfected, and prune practices that ought to be prohibited. Yet we see later that she ends up persecuting minorities in service of a fascist regime because for her, it's not really about upholding the ideals of the institution, it's about her own personal power. You're lying. Wands only choose witches and you are not a witch. But I am. Tell them, Rich, tell them what I am. It's not a moral position that she was making, but a personal one. And it reflects how ultimately the Ministry of Magic itself falls into fascism because it's unwilling to address the issues inherent in its system, how it's all about people being able to have power over others, not actually making a moral stance about making sure that they are there to stop people from being harmed. 
Thus, we can see how the same magic cops that jailed fascists within the story become fascists themselves by the end of the seventh book. Umbridge and the other Aurors are not the problem, they're a symptom of a system that allows and enables itself to do inaction in the name of harm, and lets itself fall into fascism because that's what it's enabling. All this exists within the text of Harry Potter, yet in the end, Rowling fails to understand this critique that she herself was displaying. The Ministry of Magic is not only upheld at the end of Harry Potter, but we learn that Hermione becomes a Minister of Magic and Harry Potter becomes a wizard cop, having neither addressed nor changed any institutional problems within the Ministry of Magic. This is the same institution that even before it fell into fascism would allow itself to send someone like Hagrid to the same prison that they send murderers, despite the fact that Hagrid just had a magical creature when he shouldn't have had. This even gets individualized. Snape, for example, gets to be revered as a hero for one act of sacrifice, despite being an abusive, angry, incel fascist man for his whole entire life. Or it can be how Harry can be okay with the Malfoys walking away at the end of the Wizarding War without any repercussions, without them being held accountable for their actions, and have them be incorporated back into society without any reconciliation. The same issues are also still very much present but become even more confused in the Fantastic Beast movies. Take the series villain Grindelwald, who is once again meant to represent a fascist wizard sort of Hitler in the films. But here, instead of like Voldemort being the product of ingrained prejudices of the wizarding world made manifest into a single lonely fascist boy, Grindelwald is the one asking for a change of a society and wanting to avert World War II. That is what we are fighting. That is the enemy. Yet apparently he's evil because he kills babies, like Voldemort did, you see. Yet at the same time, the wizarding government can sentence people to literal death with barely a trial. A system that is taken advantage of quite literally by Grindelwald, the fascist wizard Hitler man, in the context of the story. Nor in the third Fantastic Boost movie is it addressed that literally you could nominate a wizard Hitler to become the leader of the government as we see at the end of that film. But none of that is really addressed and in fact is just again individualized solely on Grindelwald as a character. All the problems within the story are the outpouring of a single man and his ideology, not the systemic systems that allow him to continually have chances to come to power or to take advantage of them. It showcases how in Rowling's prequel, keeping the status quo is ultimately more important than the actual message of the villain. This is a problem of many prequels such as this, where it ultimately is about upholding a status quo that we saw previously in the sequel series, but it also creates a very confusing message within the film itself. One where we are forced to recognize the inequalities of the system that we see throughout the Wizarding World, but the system itself cannot be overhauled. In fact, the ones calling for the system to change have to inherently become the villains of the piece, even while we recognize that there are systemic injustices being done. The fact that textually Grindelwald in the Fantastic Beast movies is trying to avert World War II and our heroes are trying to stop him is deeply fucked up and shows how Rowling was never really about discussing stopping fascism in her Harry Potter books, but that her books and her work were always about vilifying change to the status quo instead. A system that inherently marginalizes so many people, but allows women like her to stay near the top. All of this isn't to say that the other issues aren't necessary to address within our series, and I want to be very clear. Rowling's contempt for and unwillingness to address the poor representation of minorities despite the problems being numerous and genuine, and her failure to even give a shit about it showcases how deeply ingrained her ignorance is. We can no longer offer the good faith that these are simple oversights on her part because she said numerous chances to listen to them, just as she said numerous chances to learn about trans people before she enacted her transphobia. Still, all of this including the transphobia, are all just indicative of a worldview that centralizes individual action over recognizing systemic issues. It's a neoliberalist point of view that fails to understand how a system continually justifies marginalization and continued consolidation of power, rather than any actual change to the status quo that would benefit everyone. It allows her to not look at her own actions as they exist within larger systems that perpetuate harm because she's being a good person. So if she believes she's being a good person, then all the other stuff couldn't possibly have come from her. It allows her to continually to centralize her own privilege as being innate and natural without understanding how that privilege is itself enabling harm to many others around her, especially those who aren't like her and who she doesn't necessarily understand or have direct interaction with in her daily life. Oh, and by the way, 
If you're saying like, well, this is a children's book, it doesn't need to go into all that stuff. If you want an excellent 90s to early 2000s children's book series that understands systemic harm to children and goes fucking hard anti-establishment and against war, um, Animorphs is out there for you. I I'm just saying, uh, you'll be pissed at the ending of Animorphs, but that's because the author intended that. It doesn't have all this all was well ending bullshit either. Anywho, we'll just push this back over here. Thank you, K.A. Applegate, we love you. So I was editing the video and I realized that this section needed a little bit of a wrap up because I want to be extra, extra clear on this point as I don't want to come across as if I'm trying to let Rowling off the hook for the choices that she made in depicting certain different groups in her series. In fact, far from it. Her stereotypical and offensive depictions throughout her work of numerous groups were indeed ingrained in her by her upbringing and made invisible to her quite often by the fact that it was just seen as natural and normal around her as a woman of relative economic means and being white. But that does not remove her from understanding these problems for numerous reasons. Firstly, she or an editor should have recognized these issues before the books came out and it would have been caught if she had any friends in her orbit who did this type of sensitivity reading for her. But even worse, she definitely had more chances to understand or fix and even address these issues as the series became more popular and these criticisms became more and more forefront to many people who were reading them. But instead of doing that, she actively refused to listen and instead doubled down on her own privilege to keep making these mistakes over and over and over again without consequence, as her work continued to grow and take off into further spin-offs and works. I'm not letting her off the hook, I'm actually calling her out for continually refusing to self-analyze and instead perpetuating harm and also, frankly, in perpetuating bad storytelling. I'm also not saying that any specific issue, such as anti-fatness or anti-Semitism or even transphobia in her work, isn't important. They very, very much are. But all of them together, and the fact that there are so much of it in her work, despite it being literally about these systems causing these problems textually within the series' actual story, is all stemming from her inability to see how these systems harm others outside of her own status as a white woman. In fact, she ultimately upholds these systems because they benefit her and her place within them, and instead within her series says it's an issue of a few bad apples when fascism occurs within these systems, despite articulating within her work how systems can perpetuate and even encourage fascism. And also, at the same time, as we'll get into, this failed response on Rowling's part is also actively encouraged within our own world today by our white supremacist society that manufactures the idea that someone's power and money is equatable to someone of marginalized identity's dignity. So all of this is how Rowling continues to perpetuate her own privilege and see her privilege as something innate and natural to her without unpacking it or recognizing it, and how it enables her to continue to enact transphobia without realizing the harm that she's causing. Yet, what's even more interesting to me is that all this critique that I just gave is something we rarely hear about Rowling's work. When we do talk about criticisms of Rowling, we do hear the more memeable bits like, haha, she named a black person Shacklebolt. On names alone, she she has a wonderful way yeah. with names. Yeah. Um, we get to hear the easy, memeable takedowns, but whenever something more systemic gets brought up or asked to be addressed, such as with recently John Stewart talking about the anti-Semitism of the goblins within her series, people are all like, "I love the Harry Potter movies." Like, you ever see the scenes in Gringotts Bank? And they're like, "I love the scenes in Gringotts Bank." He's like, do you know what those folks that run the bank are? And they're like, "What?" And they're like. Jews. And, and then that, I remember. And then that person says, no, goblins. <laughs> and then you go, you're like, do you hear let, yourself? Let me show you this from, uh, it's the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. I just want to show you a caricature. And they're like, oh, look at that. That's from Harry Potter. And you're like, no, <laughs> yeah. that's a caricature of a Jew from an anti-Semitic piece of literature. J.K. Rowling was like, can we get these guys to run our bank? And you're like, this is, it's, it's a wizarding world. It's a world where it's <laughs> you like. You can imagine anything. The train station has a half a thing and no one can see it. And we can ride dragons and you've got a pet owl. And who, who runs should, the bank? Who should run the bank? Uh, 
Jews. <laughs> People react vitriolically to it because it's seen as an attack against Rowling's goodness. We as a culture put Rowling on such a pedestal of purity, and because we also view anti-Semitism as an individual failing, not a deeply ingrained cultural and systemic issue that benefits those in power that is perpetuated by individuals, both consciously and unconsciously, people instead rush to Rowling's defense when these criticisms come up. This framing is perpetuated by the media, which itself only views issues through individualistic lenses, framing critiques as a battle between individuals, like Rowling versus Jon Stewart, rather than Jon Stewart calling out this ingrained issue that Rowling's work is emblematic of. As a result, in this situation, Stewart got seen as attacking Rowling and had to make it very clear otherwise, because how dare we or anybody ever critique Rowling, perfect pure hero and crusader for women's rights and not seen it as a light-hearted conversation amongst colleagues and chums uh, <laughs> having a larf in enjoying ourselves uh, uh, about Harry Potter and my experience watching it for the first time in a theater as a Jewish guy and and how some tropes are so embedded in society that they're uh, basically invisible even in a considered process like movie making right this morning I wake up it's trending on Twitter, and here's the headline from Newsweek. Jon Stewart accuses J.K. Rowling, 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 J.K. Rowling of anti-Semitism. So let, let, me, let me just say this, like super clearly, as clearly as I can. I do not think J.K. Rowling is anti-Semitic. I did not accuse her of being anti-Semitic. I do not think that the Harry Potter movies are anti-Semitic. I really love the Harry Potter movies, probably too much for a gentleman of my considerable age. <laughs> and it leads to the fact that I spoke about earlier how Rowling's problems have been so neutered in public discourse. As a result, it allows people who read Rowling's work to not address it ourselves. And I include myself in this. It speaks to not only Rowling's willful blindness, but our cultures. I'll very much admit, I grew up reading Harry Potter, and I heard, at the time, a lot of the criticisms of characters like Cho Chang, but I thought, what a ridiculous thing to critique. That's so silly and dumb. Of course she's not racist. Of course she's not anti-Asian. What a silly thing. Just get over it. It's not a big problem. When, in actuality, I should have listened to it and been open to hearing it. Just because I'm hearing criticism of something I love doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. But we don't want to understand that we contribute to systemic harms, even in things that we really appreciate and adore. Sadly, the voices of the marginalized who point out these issues are often sidelined, undervalued, or seen as attacks on someone that you don't like. So while it's seen as a requirement that people's privilege and access to platform continues, marginalized people are deemed too self-important if they speak up, and are ignored, or if they get too vocal about it, framed as attacking what they are rightfully criticizing. And I'll be very honest that this is something I became only more aware of as I came out as trans and came to understand, yeah, systemic harm is a fucking thing. And being very self-reflective, it's something that I'm only starting to understand and address because she targeted a community that I'm a part of. That opened me up to realizing the harm that she's caused others. And that's a problem not of her alone, but of me. I should have been more open to hearing these things before I personally was involved. It speaks to my own privilege as a white person and someone of an upper class background. It's sadly a thing that many white people like myself often do. Ignore issues until it affects you. And as a result of us ignoring those voices, we often perpetuate these systemic issues and harms, and sometimes even in our individual actions, assuming we understand when we don't. And because we have privilege, ignore when we do cause harm. And when confronted with this fact, when forced to look at it, we have an existential crisis, and we want to feel like we're still good people, and so can often not acknowledge our mistakes and can oftentimes double down on them. This is something wonderfully analyzed in my friend and fellow creator FD Signifier's video on Bo Burnham's Inside. But for many, Rowling is giving the blind faith people give to saints. She is a perfect author and person, and if she is perfect, the critiques against her are inherently unjustified. And following that line of thought, all criticisms, however valid they may actually be, become attacks. And so, if people believe that these are attacks, then they must come up with a reason that Rowling is being attacked, and since she's a woman who claims to be speaking up for women's rights, these attacks are often chalked up to sexism. 
This dynamic was discussed excellently in the book What's Up With White Women, Unpacking Sexism and White Privilege, though through the lens of racism and white women having to confront that they may contribute to racist systems. But we see a similar dynamic occur when it comes to transphobia. White women also awaken to the reality of racism, but we're not really sure how or what to do and may lash out in our frustration. Because we are actively fighting the weight of sexist oppression, we frequently find it difficult to acknowledge any unearned privileges from white privilege. To admit we behave in racist ways, make racist assumptions, even unconsciously, or benefit from white privilege feels like it would undermine all our hard work as women. Instead, we vehemently defend our behaviors when we are called on our racism. After all, we are strong, powerful women who have battled extremely hard to get ahead. Don't you see that? We saw this often with Bindel, that pushback on our anti-trans hate was framed as an attack on women's rights. She said it herself. It's because she only sees her privilege and her form of womanhood, the version of womanhood that she understands, as the only valid version of womanhood, and sees trans people's womanhood as not really real. However, because cisgender women like Rowling do experience sexism, they will filter all attacks on them through that lens, and say that because trans women don't experience sexism the same way that they do, it's invalid and thus must be from men attacking them sexistly, without understanding how different people from different backgrounds and identities will face different and often intersecting forms of marginalization that don't exactly mirror her own, that she faces as a white cisgender woman of economic means. Trans people, black people, and many other marginalized groups, when critiquing privileged women like Rowling, aren't seen with any good faith that Rowling is given. And this isn't something exclusive to when people criticize white women of privilege. We often see many marginalized people seen as attacking white men, attacking white men's rights, when we're pointing out the privilege and harm that white men in patriarchal societies cause. The reason they feel attacked is because their privilege is being criticized, not them as white men. For a side example, I don't want to get into a whole discussion on Ye's recent fall into horrific anti-Semitism, and will direct you to a video that Sophie from Mars is making about him, and possibly will be released by the time this video is released. Though it's important to note that Ye is also reflective of how bigoted individuals are often propped up and used to propagate and normalize bigotry in the mainstream. However, beyond that discussion though, there was one particular interview that Ye gave where he reflected upon this idea of how pointing out the privilege of white men is equated to an attack on them as people, something that he also didn't seem to self-analyze. Of course I'll be judged by that because when people come into power, people get judged. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's nobody that gets judged more than a straight white male. The straight white male has the least amount of a platform to even speak. A straight white male can't say, my wife hurt me today, because people will say, well, you're hurting women. A straight white male can't say, hey, a black employee didn't come in to work on time, because then people will say, you're racist. A straight white male can't speak on a homosexual person, because uh, they'll say you're, ho you're homophobic. And so I empathize with the position of the straight white male. And part of the reason why I empathize with that position is because I know that I'm headed to that position. And what position that is? That is top power position. Here, Ye is kind of saying the quiet part out loud, how we empathize more with people in power's privileged position than we do with the marginalized folks' ability to have our own dignity and talk about how we are systemically harmed or people don't listen to us, and how we see these two things as equatable. How even people from marginalized communities will have more empathy for someone's privileged position rather than a marginalized community itself, even their own. In fact, Ye, quite literally at the end of that clip, showcased that he identifies more with white men because he sees himself as reaching that place of privilege. And this is often how people will filter how they see other people being attacked through their own experiences of feeling attacked or feeling pressured. For white men, who often don't face systemic harms, they will feel that marginalized people are dealing with the same level of harm that they are. It's a lack of ability on their part to empathize. And I'll be quite frank, as I spoke about it earlier, this is something that when I was seen as a boy and I hadn't really experienced any systemic marginalization because I was publicly seen as a boy, I also didn't fully understand as well. But since coming out as trans, it's something that I've been more aware of as I've seen more and more how my voice is pushed down, ignored, or vilified often just based on who I am as a trans woman and as a woman and as a trans person. 
This isn't to say that white men shouldn't be able to empathize, but our culture doesn't teach white cisgender men to be able to do so and doesn't give them the tools to understand and in fact actively encourages them not to. Through Ye here, we can see a similar manufactured discourse happening. How his anti-Semitism is being platformed by right-wing groups that are also platforming transphobia, like Tarko Carlson, in order to normalize anti-Semitism in mainstream discourse, while simultaneously being able to denounce the anti-Semitism that Ye is spewing by framing it as just the opinions of a single man, which are also often framed as being a result of his mental health issues. Which, to be clear, mental health issues and problems do not cause someone to be anti Semitic. Through this, we can see how transphobia and anti-Semitism often work in conjunction with each other, and to the same ends, to uphold privilege and power as the same as marginalized identities' dignity. Now, to be clear, this isn't to say that transphobia and anti-Semitism are the same exact thing. They have their own nuances and distinctions. However, they do often and usually work together to uphold these same systems. But these systems also interlock with sexism, racism, homophobia, ableism, and more. For example, there's something important to recognize, cause I played a little bit of an important bait and switch on you earlier. Earlier in this video, I mentioned the burning of the Institute of Sexology by the Nazis, which is an event that did occur. But look at the way that I framed it. I spoke about that event as only being about transphobia alone, as if the Nazi's sole reason for targeting the Institute was about trans people as an isolated group. The way I discussed it was framed solely through the lens of me as a trans person. And I intentionally did that because I wanted to point out to you how that framing reflects how we wish to see transphobia as its own system separate from all other forces. Just as Rowling likes to see sexism as its own individual force acting upon her as a woman, without interacting with any other systems that uphold the status quo. But the Institute of Sexology was not targeted solely by the Nazis because of trans people, which it was in part but also because Magnus Hirschfeld and those who helped fund and run the Institute were Jewish and gay, and how Jewish folks at the time under the Nazis were seen as having generated the idea of the existence of trans people, when in reality, trans people have always existed and Hirschfeld was just helping us understand ourselves and working with us. And by the way, Hirschfeld himself is not a perfect human being either. There's stuff you could talk about with him that I highly recommend Cops Hate Moe's video on. But this reflects how all Jewish folks at the time were seen as behind the background of the control of society and trying to create the idea of trans people and degenerates as a thing to try to bring down Weimar Germany. Now, doesn't that sound familiar to rhetoric around trans people today? Something that many gender critical women discuss, as I said earlier, the secret Jewish conspiracy of people like George Soros funding trans ideology? Or how many fascists like Matt Walls talk about the cabal of people trying to profit off of trans people's existences that you saw in his films like What is a Woman? Let's review. Vanderbilt got into the gender transition, transition game, admittedly, in large part because it's very financially profitable, and it is. They then threatened any staff members who objected, and then enlisted a gang of trans activists to act as surveillance in order to force compliance. And they now castrate, sterilize, and mutilate children, as well as adults, while apparently taking steps to hide this activity from the public view, which is why we had to sift through web archives and track down videos not available to the general public just to confirm all of this information. We're left in the end, once again, with a stark reality, that the field of medicine has been infiltrated and co-opted by radical ideologues, by left-wing cultists and LGBT extremists, Vanderbilt, like so many other medical institutions, has sacrificed both science and ethics on the altar of gender ideology. Or we could talk about how literally fascist men like Gavin McInnes, who created the Proud Boys, are using Ye, a black man, to be able to platform their own anti-Semitism. I would probably wager that in your average hospital in New York, maybe a third or less believe in Christ. So are you suggesting we get rid of two thirds of the doctors? Not get rid of, like not violently get rid of them. I think, them? I think that Jews are very intelligent, but they don't deserve to be in charge of everything. It showcases how all these oppressive forces, sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, all work together to harm all of our communities from working together to learn about ourselves and uplift ourselves. And it is to our own detriment to only tell the story as about only one form of oppression because it allows us to just venerate our own certain specific victimhood when we're all infringed together as a community by interlocking systems that push us all down. 
all these systems work in conjunction with each other, as we can see in Ye's words, Rowling's transphobia, and the discourse that seeks to see them as individuals without recognizing or giving credence to the systems they are upholding while they spread their harm. But if and when they are ever canceled or deplatformed, we as people can feel like, yes, we beat the transphobe and anti-Semite, when the institutions which prop these people up and the systems behind them still exist and can continue to make more people just like Ye and Rowling. Yet, it's particularly unique when we do talk about it when it comes to white women like Rowling, in the sense that upper class white women are often understood to be victims and face sexism. And I want to be clear, Rowling has faced sexism and abuse. She's been open about being a survivor of sexual abuse, and I'm also sure she's faced numerous attacks over the years for her work on Harry Potter and elsewhere over the fact that she's a woman. In fact, I did a whole video last year discussing how I've seen even some people using sexism to attack JK Rowling for her transphobia, which is absolutely awful and defeats the entire point of standing up for all of our rights, trans people or women's rights generally. I'm not saying that we don't fight bigotry, but we don't use the tools of those who cause us harm to do so, as that just perpetuates these same harms within our own community as we're trying to dismantle them. By doing so, it feeds into that false framing of it being trans women versus cis women, when it's really about fighting the system that oppresses us all. I earnestly, and I wish to be very clear about that, wish Rowling never had to face any of that, nor had to face any hurt that she's had to confront in her life for being a woman even though we need to and must recognize that she has faced these things. Yet the problem with gender critical ideology is that it frames trans people as the abusers, as the real sexists, sublimating this anger onto us instead of on the system that causes these harms to all of us, not recognizing that trans people ourselves are more likely to face abuse, sexual assault, discrimination, and even more for being trans and often for being women if we're trans women, but also non-binary and trans men also face this as well. Or how this protect the women narrative frames her and all upper class cisgender white women as inherent victims and trans women as natural aggressors and sees trans men as just women who have been tricked into trans ideology, again infantilizing what they see as white women. Which again goes back to the idea that we talked about earlier with how many gender critical feminists focus heavily on what they perceive to be young girls being tricked into gender ideology. And again focuses on the dangers facing women of upper class means rather than understanding how trans people are marginalized. If you look at any anti-trans or gender critical supportive articles, you'll often see it framed as trans activists having come in and attacked a poor cis woman for just speaking up for women's rights, when we're instead actively pointing out anti-trans harm cracks me up the people these days that claim that they are oppressed like just yesterday we talked about lizzo accepting her vma award and going like we need to change the laws and vote for people who are not going to oppress us anymore lady you are not oppressed and you you twitter user you are not oppressed either because when every single societal and corporate institution is on your side bending a knee to your ridiculous delusions that is not oppression you are now a privileged class Another person said, if I see, I stand with JK Rowling trending one more fucking time, I'm going to punch someone. Again, so pleasant. They're all very happy, peppy people. You'll see this in pretty much any article written up about JK Rowling, how she's just being attacked for speaking up for women's rights. Or you could take that BBC article I spoke about earlier, how it framed trans people as a direct danger to cis women by existing. Even innocuous things are framed like this, like how even the place where Rowling had her fancy brunch was being discussed as harassed and attacked for having hosted just a women's nice casual brunch. This is often how attacks on marginalized people are justified. You need to protect the children and women, usually white women, from the black people, the trans people, the insert whatever marginalized group here. It's using white women and the protection of their privilege as an upper class, yet the understanding of their secondary place as women to frame people who criticize them and their privilege as both weak and strong against them. This escalates so far to such a fervor with trans people being seen as active agents of villainous harm that even bystanders get attacked as supporting groomers and pedophiles if even they say something neutral about trans people. Take Graham Norton, for example, who was asked leading questions about trans people versus JK Rowling, and he gave a very non-committal answer. But for example, JK Rowling then, I mean, that, 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 that's harder to, to make a point with, isn't it? When you look at someone expressing what may or may not be popular opinions, but to, to, to be deluged with the kind of anger, rage, 
um, and attempts at censorship, it seems to me something more than just a, a middle-aged man kind of not being able to say something he used to say in the days of empire. Yeah, I mean, what I feel weird about this is when I'm asked about it, then I become part of this I know, discussion. I know, that's what I'm wondering. And, and all I'm painfully aware of is that my voice adds nothing to that discussion. And I'm sort of embarrassed that I'm somehow drawn into it. You know, and if people want to shine a light on those issues, then, and I hope people do, then talk to trans people, talk to the parents of trans kids, talk to doctors, talk to psychiatrists, talk to someone who can illuminate this in some way. You know, I'm very aware that as bloke off the telly, you know, your voice can be artificially amplified. And oh, once in a blue moon, that can be good. But most of the time, it's just a distraction. And it's just, you know, it's for clicks, it's for whatever, you know, that you can put my name in a headline, you know, Graham Norton slams, Graham Norton defends, Graham Norton weighs in on. And actually, Graham Norton shouldn't be in your headline. If, if, you, if you want to talk about something, talk about the thing. It doesn't, you know, you don't need to attach a Kardashian or a whatever to a serious subject. The subject should be enough in itself. His whole response, which is something he was dragged into by the interviewer, was just to listen to trans people and not just celebrities or even celebrities at all. That's it. It wasn't even directly supporting trans views and rights. Yet after this, Rowling responded by saying Norton was getting on a soapbox to define what a woman is, which he didn't do, and that he threw his support behind rape and death threats against women, which he most definitely didn't do. But even a neutral position for simply listening to trans people like Norton was calling for is framed as akin to supporting rape and death threats and attacking women. It got to such a point that Graham Norton was forced off of Twitter. So if we're talking about pure think? This seems more akin to that than I think Rowling is self-aware enough to realize. Any defense or even neutral position on trans people is seen as akin to defending groomers and perverts, which is how all trans people are seen as in these views. And so trans people, in this case, are attacked for it. It's how I was attacked after I criticized Rowling. My tweets were seen as attacking her right to have people buy her products, and I was harassed endlessly. It must be hard knowing that, in reality, the world doesn't revolve around you or your personal fetish religious crusade. The vast majority of us normal humans love JK and her books. Why do you think you get to decide what we as the majority enjoy? Why are you such a fascist? The more than you people fight and therefore ironically abuse her and her creation, the more I actually hate you as well. You could have actually been people who deserve the so-called rights that you desire, but instead, you've proven why you don't deserve them. It also doesn't help that trans people are also not particularly settling to look at as well. But again, we could have literally looked, pun intended, past that if you are actually true and deserving people, which in more ways you prove that you're not. Ew. You are a man. You are a man. He's a man. You're mentally ill. Sex is real and there's only two of them. Gender is based on sex. Gender expression is a personality trait, not a sex. You're a man. You'll always be a man. Sewing on some boobs doesn't make you a woman. It makes you an abomination. This man should not be allowed near children. Trans women are con men. We don't care if your deluded male mind is hurt by a woman standing up for women. This is heading one way. When people are ignored like women are being ignored, it's going to end up going one way, which won't end well for this so-called trans community. You're a man. Shut the fuck up, faggot. Kill yourself. Save the planet. Kill yourself. Now, to be fair, I've endured harassment before. Sadly, being trans on the internet means you're gonna get it. 
and it's been much worse as of late for all trans people. This is in large part due to things like the groomer narrative that is being pushed that continues to speak about LGBTQ people generally and trans people as boogeymen, as trans people as freaks, monsters, deformed, violent, and actively attacking women and children's safety. And as that narrative continues to grow and becomes one of the more main prevalent narratives about us, violence and harassment against us is therefore justified. But Rowling's tweets, even in the face of all of this, brought more harassment than I've ever gotten in my life. The closest I ever came to getting this much harassment was after I released a video on Matt Walsh a few months ago. And that was a video where I literally very clearly talked about how Matt Walsh is a fascist man stoking anti-trans violence. Here, when I was talking about Rowling, I was saying much less targeted things, and yet still got it way, way more. It speaks to the sheer size of Rowling's platform. Some people even actively cheered on my harassment. Tweets excited about Rowling taking down yet another trans person, because they didn't really care what I had to say, only that I was trans and therefore the enemy. We're seen as sexist attackers, villains, even for pointing out the most basic of facts. Lies intended to lead to our harm are being spread about us, because people only see the vilified versions of us, not who we actually are. What this rhetoric is really doing, however, is making calling for someone not to get money equitable to attacking trans people's well-being. We equate, as a culture, her privilege with trans people's sense of safety as equally valid things to go after each other for. I can't attack your humanity, but she can attack mine. But I attack her revenue income, and I'm attacking her personally, apparently. It's a double standard that perfectly demonstrates how we actively hold the same things in different values. How someone's privilege is at the same level as a whole group of people's ability to feel safe and welcome in society. It's really hard to articulate what it feels like to be talked about on this level that Rowling put me at. You see, normally I could compartmentalize the harassment that I felt. Like I could turn off, you know, my YouTube comments or walk away from something. But with this, everyone was talking about it. I got messages from my workplace Slack at GameSpot from people who had nothing to do with my YouTube channel or any of my discourse about Harry Potter. I would go on to Twitter or random gaming subreddits or even some of my favorite online magazines, and I would see this issue, my tweets, being discussed. Like I said before, I even had it come up at Christmas parties with people that were around me. I just could not escape it. And, you know, there were numerous people that were talking about the points that I made and agreeing and disagreeing with me, and that's totally fine. But what was worse is in every single discussion, there were people calling me a freak, calling me monstrous, dehumanizing me, attacking me, calling me stupid, calling me an idiot. I had to face that, no matter what, no matter where I went. All because Rowling decided to retweet me. I can't describe how hard it is to focus on being a creator, or more importantly, a person during all of that. I just wanted to go home and visit my family in Buffalo and, and just be present for Christmas and, and, and be away from all of this. And yet I couldn't. It just constantly was brought up my brain over and over and over again. People reaching out, talking to me, wanting to go over discourse, inviting me on platforms, and all that's really cool, but I just wanted to exist away from having to argue for my basic human rights as a person. It controlled my brain so much that I literally wrote this script that I'm saying to you right now on Christmas Eve because my brain was continually forced to think about rolling. There was no escape and I just had to get it out or I couldn't be present with my own family. And that's just me. I'm a trans person who, you know, I'm not anyone huge or anything, but I have, you know, a platform and people who are willing to listen to me and hear me and willing to come to my aid and support. There are many trans people who don't have that. There are many people that don't have the backing, the social support that I have. Many don't even live in relatively trans safe areas like I do here in Seattle. And yet what I've just described that Rowling has done, Rowling does to trans people, all trans people, generally. And she's also done it to even smaller creators, trans people who don't have any of this backing or support. I know how much it's shit for me, I can't even imagine what it's like for them. And on top of all of this, something that we don't also really discuss is that this anxiety, stress, and fear that she placed me in doesn't ever go away after this point. Because I am now a well-known trans figure who speaks out against Rowling, I've been made a target by her Eye of Sauron. The attention Rowling gave me put a spotlight on me from anti-trans groups that Rowling frequents and supports. I'm a name to them now, to a degree that I wasn't before. Rowling put me on that level as someone worth going after. She named me as a target, which means that more than likely I'll be more likely to be harassed and targeted and gone after, sometimes violent and sometimes physically, from this point on. 
And all of this because I said not to buy something. I cannot say this loudly enough. There is nothing wrong with saying that people should boycott Harry Potter. Even if you disagree with me, I'm allowed to say that we should boycott something. And yet it's okay to attack my basic humanity simply for stating my opinion, for using my free speech. Just because we're making people feel uncomfortable doesn't mean that what we're saying is wrong. And besides, I'm saying it in tweets and videos. It's not like I'm nagging you in person about it. In fact, oftentimes many trans people in person, myself included, don't want to cause a stir to those around us and just want to live our lives without being attacked. I don't want to talk about Rowling, and yet I'm seen as the one obsessed with her because she's the one bringing us up all the damn time. I can't escape her, and yet I'm the one that's supposedly obsessed with her. Trans people saying boycott something is strange as if we're trying to take something away from you, which we aren't. We are telling you not to get something but consuming in our culture is framed as something that you must do, an act that you must take. So to tell you to not do it is to take that act away from you. In fact, what's interesting to me is not buying something gets framed as further harm even to people who do believe that Rowling is transphobic and causing harm with their platform. The debate is still framed in terms of it being a moral good to buy the game even if you don't support Rowling or her transphobia. Because you see, another criticism that I constantly heard about me calling for people not to purchase something like Hogwarts Legacy, even from trans people in support of allies, was that the developers of the game, Avalanche Studios, had nothing to do with rolling transphobia. They were just making a game like Hogwarts Legacy that all of us just want to play. They were completely innocent in this. And so to not buy the game, to not support them, means that you're harming these innocent developers who had nothing going on with Rowling's transphobia. In fact, many people even pointed to the fact that the developers added the ability to play as a trans person within the game itself. So they're trans supportive at Avalanche Studios. Gonna peep at the Hogwarts Legacy state of play. I hate the idea that this media will support JK's hateful ass. But at the same time, those developers have nothing to do with that and don't deserve reflected hate. Jesse, when it comes to Hogwarts Legacy, I think you are ignoring something. The character creator. It's gender unlocked. You can create an avatar where you control the appearance and voice and decide whether it's a witch or a wizard. Show me another game where you get this freedom. I don't want to support rolling, but I do want to support the devs and show other game developers this is a good thing. So for trans people like myself and our allies to argue that purchasing the game is causing harm is actually actively attacking innocent developers. So people on Reddit want Hogwarts Legacy banned because of JK Rowling? Last I checked, the game company said she has no input or ideas for the game. I agree she's awful, but hurting developers of this game is wrong. They work to make money for their family. Please understand that. It places the argument of the moral good upon purchasing and that not buying is an active harmful choice. But this isn't true for numerous reasons. First and foremost, let's address this idea that developers are harmed if you don't buy the game. Developers get paid during the game making process. The workers are paid for their labor as they work on it. They aren't monetarily hurt if the game doesn't sell well at the end point. However, if I'm being honest, this is a very limited viewpoint on how this sort of system works because to be fair, if the game doesn't sell well, it is very possible that Avalanche software could be shut down and those workers could lose their jobs. I heard everything they've shown us of Hogwarts Legacy, so I'll be buying the game. I'll support the devs. Don't BS saying the devs have been paid. If the game is fantastic but fails commercially, the developers may not be hired again or fired. This is true of any company that fails to sell well in any industry, but it is a deeply significant and real concern in the video game industry especially. I'd highly recommend the book Press Reset by Jason Schreier, where he talks about the volatility in job insecurity that is rampant throughout the video game industry. The endless amounts of closures of video game studios and layoffs that run rampant throughout the entire industry. And how those closures are not always just because a game does not sell well. For all the attention we pay to crunch, which is a good thing and excessive overtime is definitely a problem in the games industry, it's the volatility that drives people out. It's the thought of having to take a new job every two years, having to move across the world that is, first and foremost, on top of the list of issues that have driven people out of the video game industry. It's not just the sales failures that lead to this volatility. It's not just, we made a bad game, all right, we're getting shut down. 
I explore a lot of these cases in the book where people are making successful games, people are swimming in money, they should be able to create a sustainable environment. Whether it's corporate shenanigans or mismanagement with a CEO who loves lavish spending, there could be all sorts of reasons. These studios just shut down all the time, and it's just a bummer to see. In video games, the revenue has just gone up and up and up and up. The latest figure I saw is it's a $180 billion industry. So this is an industry where a lot of people are making a lot of money, unlike media, where it's a little more understandable where companies struggle. In games, the fact that there's this volatility and people are left wondering, like, how they're going to feed their kids while the industry as a whole is making obscene amounts of money, that, to me, is really the biggest difference between this and media or any other field that is maybe a little less lucrative. The one solution to volatility that I think is going to be the most important and the most pressing and the most effective is people organizing and creating unions within the video game industry. It's kind of weird that it still hasn't happened. But the idea that workers should have a seat at the table and be able to have some sort of influence and say as to how the company that they operate moves forward is one that is really essential. And especially when it comes to some of the mismanagement we've seen and some of the problems we've seen and being able to communicate to your workers. This is not trans people's fault that this system exists. It's the video game industry, which again is the same story, different tune. It's a discussion that privileges the wealthy continuing to make money, even if it means costing the workers at the bottom their jobs and their ability to survive. Despite the fact that it is the developers who do all the hard work to keep the company running and get video games made. So if your real and earnest concern is that the studio behind Hogwarts Legacy will close if the game doesn't sell well, that's not an argument for buying the game. The actual argument, if that's your worry, is for better regulation of the video game industry as well as for supporting worker unionization, so that workers don't suffer simply at the whims of corporate greed without any recourse. To fight for workers to have a sense of stability and safety instead of what they have now, which is an ever-present anxiety around the fact that they may lose their livelihoods if they don't work hard enough, or there's a controversy around the game they're working on that is out of their control or simply the whims of a company that doesn't care for their lives at all, but only their bottom line, and even more so the executives at the top. Buying the game ultimately just gives more money to the executives in charge of the game, not the actual workers themselves who get paid the same either way. The workers shouldn't have to worry regardless of the game sales if they're going to have a job next week, considering how much money Warner Brothers executives make, money that could go to the workers doing the actual work. That's the real fight, not an argument for buying the game. It's on the CEOs who decide to cut workers instead of taking a pay cut for that studio closing, not trans people. Further, if the fact that Rowling's transphobia ends up being the reason for the studio not selling enough copies of Hogwarts Legacy to stay open, which again, it probably won't be, I'm very well aware that the boycott is not going to demonstrably hurt the bottom line of this game, that's still not trans people's fault. Because you see, if Hogwarts Legacy was put into production after Rowling's transphobia came out, it's on Warner Brothers Interactive for having forced Avalanche Software to take the project. And if Warner Brothers didn't force the decision on them, it's on Avalanche Software's leadership for accepting the project in the first place and putting their workers at risk of working on a controversial game. Even further, we spoke about the problems inherent in J.K. Rowling's stories, and that seems to be perpetuated in Hogwarts Legacy. The game's story is a prequel where you are a Hogwarts student fighting against a goblin rebellion, helping stop a rebellious goblin leader, Rannoch, who is allied with a dark wizard fascist, Victor Rookwood, from destroying the social order. As you unravel a dangerous mystery by working alongside the accomplished and yet enigmatic Professor Fig to try and discover if the rumors of a mounting goblin rebellion hold any weight, and if the safety of Hogwarts lies in the balance. I have. Opinions differ as to how great a threat he really is. In fact, there's an uneasy alliance between the goblins and dark wizards. You said you could get to the child when they came to Hogsmeade, but all you needed was a distraction. I gave you a distraction. I just watched a student take down your distraction. But given the anti-Semitic coding of goblins, this story kind of feels like it leans into conspiracy theories about Jewish people. 
As you can see in the clip I just showed, one of the plot points of the game involves the goblin villain attempting to kidnap your character, who is a literal child, in order to get rid of him. This rings very similarly to the horrid anti-Semitic blood libel trope, which was the trope and accusation by non-Jews that Jews were kidnapping and murdering non-Jewish children in order to perform magic rituals. This dates all the way back to the Middle Ages, where by the 13th century, Christians were accusing Jews of trying to kidnap children for their blood, and it led to the incitement of violence against Jewish people, and has continued to be used against Jewish people to incite violence against them for centuries all the way to this day. Now, I am not the best person to go further into the long history of this trope, so I'd recommend this Museum of Jewish Heritage video that goes further into the subject. But for Hogwarts Legacy to use a goblin character, which is a species in Harry Potter that already has associations of anti-Semitism, and then to have him fighting against slavery of his own people but lean into the blood libel trope in order to do so, is a major, major issue. It not only utilizes quite textually anti-Semitic tropes, but then also uses it to vilify people fighting for their own rights at the same time. Which goes back to the problem that we were talking about earlier with the entire Harry Potter franchise, how it's not always about fighting fascism and oppression, but about keeping the status quo, a status quo that keeps certain people on top based on just who they are. Even if this wasn't intentional and there was no desire to be anti-Semitic, it shows the same lack of awareness on the developer's part about the implications of the plot of the game. Like, if this was the story that you deeply wanted to tell within this Harry Potter world, you could have picked literally any other magical race that hadn't had criticisms of being rooted in anti-Semitism. It was just that simple. I don't know, why not make it a centaur rebellion? At the very least, by doing that, it's not leaning into anti-Semitism, and I get to look at hot shirtless dudes and try to ignore the horse parts. But even if they did that, it would still be another story of reaffirming a status quo that harms many marginalized people while actively vilifying a person trying to fight to end the to continue disenfranchisement of his people. So there's still that inherent issue within the game story as well, even if you made it about centaurs. But vilifying groups fighting for a change of the status quo because of the oppression they faced is kind of par for the course for Hollywood and any corporate made media these days. See this video that I did a little while ago about how this takes place in Marvel movies, for example. But the fact that it's about goblins makes it worse. And it's also worth saying that some of these story ideas and their implications might have even been intentional. The reason I say this is that it was discovered that a former Gamergate YouTuber was a project lead on the game, and he only left the project after that fact was discovered, and still remains friends with many of the developers of the game to this day. And evidently, even Warner Brothers was aware of his channel at the time that they hired him. That everybody understands how WB Games has interacted with me, and I want to give them some praise. First of all, they helped me through all this transition down here to Southern Nevada and were very supportive through all that. Also, they really did review my videos back in 2018 uh, when I first joined Avalanche. And at that time, they were clear that they said, well, this does fit within our social media policy, uh, but we don't endorse anything you've said here, which was fine, right? I, I was comfortable with that. I was just happy that they were willing to allow me to keep my videos up. Meaning that they actively did not care or wanted the person who made videos like this to be working on their game. The social justice movement is secular in nature. On its face, it generally rejects religion as being a tool of both past and present oppression. There are some exceptions, but even in those cases, Social justice causes are given priority above religious faith. However, much like religion, the social justice movement is an all-encompassing framework that its adherents use to view the world. It reigns supreme in its influence upon the minds of its believers, and they will jealously submit to no other ideology. It is also faith-based in that it presumes that adherence to its tenets will result in an improved society. Tellingly, some early proponents of social justice shortened the name for their emerging secular religion to be Sokjus. Critics immediately recognized an eerie similarity in this abbreviation to the secular religion invented by George Orwell in his book 1984 called Ingsoc. Ingsoc was newspeak for English socialism and represented the totalitarian political ideology which gave rise to Big Brother. As the nine other social justice commandments demonstrate, this similarity runs deeper than the abbreviation. Bill C-16 in Canada demonstrates this commandment in action. 
This newly enacted law requires its citizens to respond with the properly invented words when compelled to do so. So now, not only can you be found guilty of the things you do or say, but also of things that you do not do or say. Persuasion of the unconverted is not necessary when your ideology can be enforced via authority. That clip, by the way, is part of a long video about the Ten Commandments of Social Justice, where he runs through a lot of the similar talking points that we've been saying throughout this video. The idea that social justice and transgenders are trying to force you to comply with the Orwellian order, and many more things like that. His channel is by no means the worst that I have ever seen when it comes to this style of anti-social justice content, but it is basically a regurgitation of the same line of thought that we've been seeing throughout this video that I've been discussing with Rowling, showcasing that this isn't just an isolated viewpoint that Rowling is having, as well as the fact that it underlines a lot of the people that are working on Harry Potter media, especially behind Hogwarts Legacy, at least in lead development positions. Now, to be fair, to give the whole benefit of the doubt, we don't know what the story is 100% yet, and there may end up being some self-awareness on the game writer's part. But the first impressions of the story, as well as the fact of it tying in with Rowling's history, doesn't give me much hope. Though, and this is a little bit of a tangent, I will say I do see some people saying that it was the entire company staff who were Gamergate supporters, which is not true. I can guarantee you that many trans supporter people, including many trans people, are probably working on Hogwarts Legacy. We can see that potentially with the aforementioned character creator, which doesn't have you pick a gender within it and allows you to make your playable character any gender presentation you want, but also at the same time pick which dormitory you wish to sleep in, the witches or wizards one, regardless of your gender presentation. And this is better than some character creators, which force you to have a feminine appearance if you choose to be a woman character, but it also does have a few issues. First and foremost, it should be noted that this does exclude the existence of non-binary people, as you have to pick between a binary dorm to live within, but that's an issue baked into Harry Potter by rolling herself from her books. But also, the character creator doesn't allow you things like being able to pick your pronouns. I guess it's a step in the right direction from some other mainstream games, but there are other games today that do it even better than Hogwarts Legacy will do, like Tiny Tina's Wonderland, which lets you choose pronouns, voice actor, hairstyle, body type, and more all independent of each other. That game's character creator showcases a more holistic approach to the character creator and highlights how different aspects of one's identity don't always have to align with each other under a binary idea of man or woman. Further, Hogwarts Legacy doesn't do anything with this transgender acceptance within the world of Hogwarts. No one will use non-binary pronouns within the world, and there's still no discussion of what queerness means within the Wizarding or Hogwarts world. Are there queer clubs? Is there a queer community? Is there a trans community? And given that Hogwarts Legacy is set in the 1800s, one would assume that transness and queerness isn't totally accepted in Wizarding society given larger British culture at the time. Or are they? Are they accepted within wizarding culture despite larger British culture at the time? And what would that mean that wizards are more accepting than muggles? But none of those questions will be addressed within the game. It's a very surface level like, ah, yeah, you can, you can be trans, uh, kind of, sort of, maybe, no one will really think about it. It just reminds me of the game Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, which lets you choose to be a non-binary CIA agent whose pronouns get respected by President Ronald Reagan himself, who notably let the queer community get ravaged by AIDS without care in real life. It's a very tokenistic, surface-level, shallow inclusion. But even if it weren't, even if the trans inclusion within Hogwarts Legacy was the best, most inclusive character creator ever made, it's still a game that supports the attention given to the Harry Potter franchise, and even worse, this excuse of saying, well, they allow trans people to be in the game, allows those who play Hogwarts Legacy to feel good about buying something that still perpetuates the platform of someone causing direct harm to the trans community. The trans character creator, in whatever form it takes, lets you feel like it's okay to play the game because it shallowly supports trans people, while the game itself is used to support an economy of hate. And this inclusion reads even more shallow given that the transgender option in Hogwarts Legacy only was announced after controversy with their lead developer came out, making it feel like there was a clear attempt to shield the game from Rowling's transphobia criticisms and other criticisms of their own dev team. Yet, if the game was started before Rowling began actively harming a marginalized group, well then it's on Rowling herself for putting not only Avalanche Software, but everyone who works on the Harry Potter franchise, like with her Fantastic Beasts movie, in a position where they are now working on a project that perpetuates the platform of a harmful bigot. And it sucks that the developers of Avalanche have been put in this situation. 
Some may be able to quit their jobs in protest if they have more obligations against Rowling, such as how actress Katherine Watterson allegedly did after she denounced Rowling's transphobia publicly and subsequently either left or was fired from Fantastic Beast 3, which honestly dodged a jelly leg chink spell there. But many other workers don't have that luxury and have many bills to pay and families to feed and just want to do their jobs. They don't really get a choice in what games that they work on. And it speaks to how capitalism forces everyone involved to be complicit, lest they fear losing their ability to survive. But again, the fact that the system does this is not on trans people. Yet, despite the numerous systems working to disenfranchise workers working on the Harry Potter franchise and the decisions of those in power above them who place them into this precarious predicament, it is instead trans people and other marginalized folks speaking up about the issues with the game and the systems it supports that get framed as the active agents of harm, and the action of buying the game itself still becomes framed as a moral good. There are some people who say, well, my buying the game isn't going to help her anyways. The money I give her and give to the Harry Potter franchise doesn't mean anything to her. All this makes people feel like, even if they recognize Rowling's harm, that they are being bad people for not buying the game. Further, even people wishing to recognize Rowling's harm against trans people are made to feel futile in the face of large, gargantuan systems that feel like they can't be pushed back against. And I know many people say and feel, well, capitalism makes us all complicit in one way or another. Why, why bother fighting this fight? Why not buy this game if it makes me happy? Rolling's gonna rolling anyways, regardless of what I do. And it creates a cognitive dissonance in people. They realize JK Rowling is causing harm, but they don't wish to feel like a bad person if they want to play the game. They want to be made to feel okay. So you end up seeing discourse around saying that it's okay to buy the game as long as you recognize Rowling's harm to help resolve this cognitive dissonance, making it seem like it's morally okay to buy the game if you at least recognize the harm that she's causing. Because what are you gonna do in the face of the system? And as a result, you end up seeing memes like this one crop up. Whether you choose to purchase the game or not, it's okay as long as you recognize that JK Rowling is an asshole. Don't let anyone persuade you otherwise. Enjoy yourself, kings. But what discourse and memes like this do is try to comfort those who want to buy the game to make them feel like they're still good people if they support a system that causes harm because they feel like they can't fight it anyways. Yet it ignores that you do actually have power. Yet it tries to make you forget that you don't have an obligation to buy the game. You don't have to give it your attention. You could actually use the time that you spend on Hogwarts Legacy to play another game. You could play something like Celeste, which is a great game by a trans creator, or go into your Steam backlog, which I know is filled with tons of games that you've never played because all of us have way too many games on our Steam backlog. But beyond simple consuming, you can learn more about trans issues and trans rights. You can educate yourself. You can give funds to trans supportive charities like Mermaids in the UK or the National Center for Transgender Equality in the US, or even better, donate your physical time to help volunteer volunteer at these organizations. As well as, beyond that, if you can, be a vocal ally to trans people in your community, even if you don't see trans people around you, because we probably are there and just aren't out yet. Allow trans people to feel comfortable around you and in spaces that you exist within. Push back against anti-trans hate or even casual transphobia like misgendering that comes up around you, even and especially if trans people aren't present. Fight for trans supportive policies in your communities and workplace. Attend trans supportive protests. All of these are all ways to be active in your support of trans rights. You don't have to support a game like Hogwarts Legacy that is directly causing harm. You could use that time and attention elsewhere. But capitalism makes you feel like you owe it something and it makes you feel like you're a bad person if you don't continually consume. But I will say it does matter on an individual level, even if the systemic feels overwhelming. I will say that buying a game like Hogwarts Legacy will tell the trans people around you that you care more for your entertainment than our dignity. It'll tell the cis people around you that it's okay to normalize buying games from people who perpetuate harm against a marginalized community. I wanna be clear, I'm not calling everyone who buys the game a transphobe. But is a game worth all of this to you, especially when there are so many other great games to play? I'm not calling you a bad person or a transphobe or an anti-trans bigot if you buy Hogwarts Legacy. But I will say, don't call yourself a trans ally while you do it. Because being an ally means being willing to give up something to actually stand with trans people. If you're not willing to fight alongside us or to give up something, then you're not really being an ally. You're just doing what you want anyways and just saying you listen to us 
when you're actively not. But to be clear, there is a difference between being a transphobe and not being an ally. There's a difference between being an active agent of harm and being passive. But if you are passive, you're allowing the people causing harm to continue the harm. Yet people are made to feel attacked if they are called out for buying the game, made to feel like they're transphobic, made to feel like it's an impugment on their character, on their person. You care about trans people, you want to support us, you will defend us in everyday life, but you aren't willing to not show us that you care more for your entertainment than about us. And when you hear that, people feel like their moral purity is being attacked if they buy the game, and again, trans people are made to be seen as the aggressors, as the bad people. When all we're asking for is to not actively fund a person's attention-getting platform that she uses to cause active harm. We end up more worrying about our individual sense of purity, just like Rowling does herself than listening to marginalized people coming to you earnestly to talk about the problems we face in these systems and our society that continually marginalizes us. It becomes about our own individual issues, our own individual purity, rather than recognizing how we all contribute to systemic harm and listening to people who wish to try to bring attention to that fact about how they are harmed. Further, the discourse of saying, oh, just recognize Rowling is an asshole if you buy the game, ends up softening Rowling's harm. Either completely disregard Hogwarts legacy and everything Harry Potter related for the rest of your life, or you just accept that Harry Potter is made by someone who doesn't agree with you on everything. And if I'm being honest, it's very likely there's many other creators out there who also have opinions that you don't agree with, they just don't voice them. But it doesn't make you morally superior than others if you don't buy the game or not. I guess it's a hot take and you can cancel me if you want, but I don't think it means you're an evil or bad person if you're excited for Hogwarts Legacy. I think what you enjoy and spend your money on is your own business. I mean, people buy Call of Duty and play Overwatch even though Activision Blizzard is a hellscape of allegations, lawsuits, and other problems. Doesn't mean that because you enjoy Call of Duty that you're somehow an evil person. You're allowed to like things even if others disagree with you. It's trying to subtly downplay your contribution to the system that Rowling is ultimately going to benefit from by making her feel like less of an issue. She's just an asshole, not someone actively working to use the system's benefit to continually systemically harm trans people. And thus, if you resolve your cognitive dissonance this way, by downplaying Rowling's harm because it doesn't affect you directly, just seeing her as an asshole or someone who just said some disagreeable things, then you must also turn and look at trans people telling you she's a bigot and supporting real horrific far-right causes as hysterical. And if we tell you that buying the game is causing harm because it is directly helping that system that leads to harm of trans people that JK Rowling is in support of, then many will react vitriolically saying that trans people are calling you a bad person for buying a game when you know that you're not, you're not a bad person, you want to support trans people. And thus, through this line of thinking, even when you want to support trans people, this system that makes buying something seen as a moral good forces you to see trans people not only as overly concerned, but again, as active villains. And it goes back to seeing us as people who deserve to be attacked. I hope I've made the case that this piece of entertainment, this specific piece of entertainment, in the face of all the great games and movies and TV shows out there made by artists who aren't horrible transphobes, and the fact that Harry Potter is being used and wielded to perpetuate harm, isn't worth it. Yet that feeling of futility, that's the most dangerous feeling any of us can feel in the face of this. Because we can do so much more. But, the fact that I have to articulate this, that I even have to make this argument, let alone spend so much time on this, and dear God, do not look at the time code on this video, is part of the problem. And this ultimately brings me to my most significant, most pressing point and concern about how this cycle is perpetuated and what this system ultimately upholds, and is what I most want to say with this video. But I had to do all of this to get to this point, which is why it's so damn tiring. Because all these controversies and conversations have all centered around whether or not you should support the Harry Potter franchise, about whether you should buy things like Hogwarts Legacy or any Harry Potter media. The question becomes, to buy or not to buy? Those are the only two options presented. And in this framing, to not buy the game is presented as a choice that is 
actively doing something. Even if you believe everything that I've told you and you've followed my logic to this point and believe me and agree with me that buying Hogwarts Legacy is harmful, then you still possibly probably believe that the way to support trans people is to not buy the game. That to do so, to not buy something, is actively fighting back against transphobia. Yet, in truth, it's not. It's passive. It's neutral. You're quite literally not doing something. All you are doing is just not actively giving money, and more importantly, continued attention and relevancy, to a hateful and harmful figure. The active choice is to buy the game, but not buying is a non-choice. It's doing nothing. To frame not buying something as an active decision presents a false catharsis. It makes you feel like you're fighting back when you're not. You are just not actively supporting harm. And this allows those who wish to fight against transphobia to feel that they accomplished something that they fought back when they did nothing demonstrable. And the framing of the choice this way ultimately upholds the harm. It deceptively frames this as a binary, a choice between causing damage and doing nothing to push back against it. And it leaves no room for actual activism. It rules it out completely. It doesn't even present it as a possibility. And that enables the harm to continue, as well as enables Rowling to continue to grow her platform because no one is pushing back. The only two groups in this framing is people who are actively giving her money and those doing nothing. And ultimately, what's deeply frustrating to me and all of this on an individual level, is I personally have become known as the boycott Harry Potter person. This is what all the media around my tweets and the discourse that came out of Rolling were centered upon. It was what was written up in Forbes magazine and BuzzFeed and elsewhere. Jesse Gender is the proponent of boycotting Hogwarts Legacy and Harry Potter media. This is what I became known for, talked about in the context of. And not just to center this on me, but this was the talking point around Rolling that existed before this moment with her and me and moved on after me. It all has focused on the discussion around how to push back against J.K. Rowling and whether or not you should buy her game or not. And for me, as the person who, for a brief 72-hour news cycle, became the focus point of this debate, it showed me how manufactured this discourse is. That there is an intention to it being framed this way. Because, to be honest, boycotting Harry Potter is the issue with Rowling I care the least about. What? 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 Despite the fact that I just made a huge long video arguing the point to you, I am not dying on the boycott Harry Potter hill. Of all the things to discuss about Rowling, it is the least important one. Quick little interlude here because I want to be very, very clear about this point when I say that boycotting Hogwarts Legacy is the issue that I care the least about. When I say that, what I am saying is not that I don't care that you buy Hogwarts Legacy or not, I do, but for me, that is like the bare minimum issue. Of course, we should not be giving money to something that is being used by someone who's causing demonstrable harm against a marginalized community and like using that to like promote the fact that she is doing that. I've had to do this whole video just to walk you to that point, all this discourse about this thing to me that honestly I consider to be very basic and the bare minimum. That is what is really frustrating me because like, of course, of course we don't continue the platform of a person who is quite literally contributing to totalitarian and authoritarian thought. Uh, it, it's just frustrating that we live in a culture and a society that makes that the discourse, that the discussion that we endlessly have to have over and over and over again. There is so much more that we should be doing. So when I say that uh, uh, boycotting Hogwarts Legacy is the thing that I care the least about, it is not that I don't care, nor that I don't think that it is like an important thing to like think about, but like it is the first thing in a long line of things that we need to be doing to fight for not only trans people, but trans liberation, as well as the liberation of everybody. Trans issues are not an isolated issue. They intersect with many, many others. And if we want to discuss those things, if we want to fight for those things, this stuff, talking about boycotting a game that is like being used for the platform of someone who's causing demonstrable harm, it's not the issue. It is just the basic thing that we should just like take as a given before we move on to do more important things. And it frustrates me that we live in a world that constantly makes it feel like you owe bigots the platform and makes that the constant talking point about whether or not we owe bigots a platform. Because, yeah, we don't. 
Simple as that. Didn't take two hours to describe that and say that, but guess what? I had to because that's where this discourse is and how it complicates it. And it's really frustrating. And that's what I wanted to articulate and be very clear about on this point. Yet, these are the points that people want to take away from what I'm saying. For example, I was interviewed directly by BuzzFeed. They literally called me. And in the interview, I did indeed speak briefly, very briefly, about the need to not buy Harry Potter merchandise. But we actually spoke for about 20 minutes about so much more. In the interview with the reporter, I talked about everything that I've been talking about and beyond, about the need to support trans causes, about the hate that Rowling has spread and those she has worked with, the very real anti-trans narratives that are being spread in our society that are causing violence against trans people. And I made it very clear that all of this is not a problem exclusive to her, but a problem that we all have to fight back against in society. This was what I spent most of the interview talking about. None of that was published. The only part of the interview that was published was the parts that I talked about my relation to Harry Potter as a kid and how hard it felt to see Rowling do all of this and attack trans people and ended on the point of me saying don't buy Harry Potter merchandise. The entire discussion was centered around Rowling and Rowling alone and everything else that I said was ignored. Now, this is not me attacking that article's author. He was very kind and nice to me. I'm not attacking him specifically. What I'm doing is I'm critiquing what media chooses to focus on. The cultural discourse being centered around buying or not buying because it all is centering around JK Rowling individually as a person. Because we have so centered the discourse on her specifically, it allows us to individualize the problem and not talk about the larger systemic issues and allows it to be about whether or not we perpetuate her privilege or not. Meanwhile, on the flip side of this false debate, people who believe the disinformation and vilification of trans people will tout their purchasing habits as if they fought some great moral fight. Look at every story or discussion or discourse or video about Rowling and Hogwarts Legacy, including probably this one, and you will find dozens upon dozens of people proudly proclaiming that they pre-ordered the ultra deluxe edition of the game or bought two copies, believing that by doing so they've become some sort of activist for women's rights, when all they did was give a billionaire bigot more money despite or because of the harm she's causing. JK is absolutely correct, and I can't wait to buy a copy of the game just because I know it infuriates your insane little cult. I'm not a gamer and was not remotely interested, but just for you, I'm buying myself a Hogwarts Legacy game. You know, I was debating on buying the game on release or waiting for it to go on sale, but after reading all that you've said about JK and the HP franchise, I've decided to do neither. I'm pre-ordering the Ultimate Edition instead. Cheers! Spending is replaced with action. Buying is framed as a moral good on either side of this. This is what she wants. This is ultimately what many in power want when they pull the I'm going to say horrible bigot things about a misunderstood minority then claim I'm being cancelled so people come to my defense. It's all done to sell merchandise. And we see this very clearly having happened here. Hogwarts Legacy is now currently the fastest selling game on Steam. All this boycott Harry Potter buzz and discourse and the controversy around it has just led to a mass support for the game by those who now feel it's a moral duty to do so and by those who feel like they want to still buy the game and have comforted themselves into believing that it's okay. Even beyond that, there are people who just want to buy Harry Potter stuff without even being aware of trans issues. And for those who didn't buy the game, it either makes them resentful at trans people for not being able to participate in something that they wish to, or they feel resentful at the fact that this discourse has just been going on and on and on when we could be doing more for trans people. And at the same time, like Rowling did before when talking about how her sales figures went up when she started ranting about trans people, all this is used by people to say, Haha, we defeated the woke agenda and the trans Orwellians. Potter franchise a lot. I'm looking forward to this game. I was looking forward to it anyway. But the idea that so many people are coming out and trying to tell you, you know, people like this, right? I mean this with every fiber of my being. Fuck you if you buy Hogwarts Legacy. This has been something that has been active on social media for months and months and months, probably over a year now. You've had these activists saying that if you go to support this, well, then you're just a terrible human being. You're a bad person, blah, 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 blah. All that has done is boost sales for this game. It's the number one bestseller for PlayStation 5 a month before it's even released. And JK Rowling talked about this not that long ago. She mocked cancel culture saying, it's kind of crazy to call me cancel because every time they try to cancel me, my book sales go up. 
And that's exactly what we're seeing with Hogwarts Legacy, a game that when most people look at it, if you're a fan of the Harry Potter franchise, if you're a fan of this world, you probably really want to try this thing out. You probably really want to play it. Now, there's definitely room for criticism. You can criticize the delays that are taking place for Hogwarts Legacy, especially for the last gen system. There's more delays out for that. Not People aren't very happy about that, and rightly so. But should you be called a bigot because you buy it just because you happen to be supporting financially J.K. Rowling, the person who created this incredible universe? Absolutely not. This is laughable. And every time these morons, these woke lunatics who have been trying this for months, every time they attempt it, it backfires. I was only going to get it once, but now I think I'm probably going to get it multiple times. I'll probably get it for PC and for PlayStation 5 because I, I want to get into this game and I want to play it and... I just want to see more of these people fucking cry. When all you did at the end of the day was give a person who incidentally is causing more harm to a marginalized group, more money, power, and attention. When you support a work of art like Harry Potter, you're spending two types of currency, money and power. You're not only helping the creator, but you're supporting their influence by consuming their media, whether you buy it or even if you pirate it, you keep it relevant by continuing to intake it. You're sending the message that you love the work regardless of whether you're willing to pay for it. It gives the job and the creator power over you and your desires. J.K. Rowling wants that. People think money is everything, but it is a stand-in for power. Money allows us to obtain what we want, go where we want, and tell others what to do. Money gives us power, and the power is the only real resource. Power is the end goal, not the money. And the only option to stop it is to not play the game. And I'm not talking about Hogwarts Legacy anymore. Hi, I'm Aranok. You might recognize me from my video essays, which can be found on my channel, same as my name. But uh, most of you probably know me as Jessie's co-writer on some of her videos. I mostly write about the importance of queer perspectives and about queer readings on art. What you probably don't know is that when I was a kid, I really liked the Harry Potter books. I don't really talk about it because it's kind of embarrassing. And we'll get to why in a moment. But this is the first book I ever read, this exact copy. It's um, actually bookmarked. It's bookmarked from the last time that I tried to reread the series. And I couldn't because it was too painful. This was probably, I don't know, 2018. People were still on the fence about how bad things were getting, but... I wanted to hold on to my childhood for a second longer and pretend that it wasn't damaged. I experienced a lot of violence as a kid. Most of it because every other kid could tell I was queer. You know, after I came out, one of the girls I went to elementary school with messaged me and said, I'm not surprised because you always felt like one of the girls to me. So, when I was a kid, I was pretty lonely. And I started reading pretty young. And Harry Potter became a safe place for me. Because uh, I needed something to disassociate into. I used to cart these books around with me and read them over and over. And over again, I actually read Order of the Phoenix. 
I read Order of the Phoenix so many times that it destroyed the spine. Um, it's, it's held together with tape. I haven't read it in a long time, and I don't want to read it again. The reason I'm saying all of this to begin this conversation is that a lot of TERFs like to make it out as if trans people are just spiteful and evil and out to get J.K. Rowling and out to get any woman that dares to, you know, punch down on a marginalized group that is currently experiencing horrific amounts of violence. And I cannot express how strongly it, that, that is so far from the truth. It is vile to claim that we want someone to hate us. Do you understand how disgusting it is to blame victims in that way. I would hope you do. I mean, I would hope you understand what it's like to be a woman in this society, but clearly a lot of you don't. When I was a kid, this was a safe place for me. As an adult, when I see anything related to that franchise, it's an immediate red flag. It tells me that I'm in danger. A couple of years ago, when I was still closeted in real life, but I was out online, I responded to someone with, you know, Hufflepuff House in their account bio, who I thought was innocently asking what the definition of pansexual is. And in my naivety, I just thought, oh, this is someone who wants to be educated, right? They, they just want to know. They just want to learn. So I told them. I would spend the next two months being continuously harassed en masse by TERFs. But most of all, by people with Harry Potter in their bio, in their profile pictures, in their account names. If you went and looked at their timelines, they'd have things that depicted J.K. Rowling as their patron saint. I'd say it's pretty disgusting to be sainted for your hate. But that's what this is. A religious fervor. A crusade. I find it ironic considering how much of these books was about how that's wrong. After I came out, but before I really tried to pass, I dealt with a lot of violence and discrimination in public. On two different occasions, women wearing Harry Potter merch stopped their shopping and stalked me through stores. One of them was stopped by security because it was so obvious that she was trying to do something to me. When I see someone wearing that shirt, I pray that they won't notice me. Because I know that that shirt, that symbol, that franchise means hate. They are synonymous in my mind. 
As such, when I saw a bunch of supposed cis allies arguing that it's actually not a bad thing that they're playing the game and that the trans people should shut up and stop whining, I tweeted a snarky single line. People will call themselves allies and then still play the wizarding game. I didn't think that it would be that controversial of a take. It went viral and for the next two months, much like several years previous, I was continuously harassed by accounts with Harry Potter in their bio. When I see Harry Potter, I see thousands of messages telling me to kill myself. I see hundreds of people I see hundreds of people calling me. <laughs> I see hundreds of people calling me a rape survivor, a rapist. Do you understand what it's like to receive that amount of attention? To be told such a horrid things by so many people. And I know so many other trans women, many of whom you're never going to hear because they have no platform, who have been similarly targeted. J.K. Rowling has decided to make herself the leader of a hate movement. That is the reality. Down to writing a fucking manifesto. Her fans, and specifically the fans of that franchise, have made it their mission to ruin trans people's lives. To ruin my siblings and my, my own life. <laughs> West Virginia is trying to pass a law that will functionally banish people, banish all trans people from public. And I see that. And then I have cis adults come groveling to me. Mm, please, I just want to play this stupid fucking wizarding game. Fuck you. I'm sorry, but your feelings about playing a crappy game, which is frankly deeply anti-Semitic, mean very little to me. Because every piece of support that she receives, monetarily, publicly, vocally, in any form, is just saying that, hey, this is acceptable in society. And I just have to ask, why are your cis feelings more important than trans lives? Why are you incapable of doing the absolute bare minimum? And I do mean the bare fucking minimum. It's literally nothing. There are hundreds of other games out there that you could go play. I'm tired. I'm really fucking tired. I'm tired of being afraid in public. I'm tired of worrying whether or not my trans siblings are going to be able to continue just existing in certain countries. Most of all, I'm just tired of the idea that this woman holds any fucking importance 
in whether or not my community gets to exist. Right-wingers speak about having their childhoods ruined. When I look back at the place that I considered safe as a kid, all I can think about is that woman stalking me in the grocery store. All I can think about is those thousands of comments telling me that I am the most vile things they can think of. J.K. Rowling, I see your name, and it is synonymous with hate. Your books are hate symbols, and you are a hate movement leader. And I want you to know, deep down, that I don't hate you. I think you are so beneath consideration to even be worthy of my hate. No, I pity you. I think you are sad and pathetic and lonely. And I hope someday that you'll learn what it is to feel empathy and love and care for other people. In the meantime, I hope your miserable, tiny, cold heart continues to shrivel. I hope your friends abandon you, and I hope that you know deep down for the rest of your life that you are one of the worst human beings currently alive. I pity you. Society places more values on consuming. It centers everything around buying or not buying as a choice. We don't need to play by those rules. It's the same false choice we see even when we understand trans rights. Ultimately, this is the point I want to get across. How all of this is the same cycle over and over and over again. Rowling gets framed as the victim allowed to spread misinformation over and over again and uses that to frame trans people as the villains. Yet it also, more importantly, subtly reinforced that her position of privilege is natural, innate, and even morally good and that it is our job to continue to perpetuate because she deserves to be a billionaire, even if it comes on the back of actively ignoring some communities while perpetuating harm against others. It's a system perpetuating itself by telling you the lie that it's about a single person. And it tells those who wish to fight back to do nothing or cling to the power that they already have within their system at the expense of those below them. Kind of like a particular magical ministry that fell into a systemic decline into its own fascism. By individualizing the problem onto Rowling and framing it as about trans people versus her, as opposed to the system, it enables the entire manufactured choice to perpetuate itself unaddressed. I'm honestly tired that so much attention is being given to Rowling. I'm tired of this video and every video I do on Rowling getting the most extensive amount of views that I get on my channel because it's how we've been forced to frame these issues. Even the debate I'm doing right now is around her because it's the most consumable, most algorithm friendly, most sellable to you in bite-sized form. Let's take down a single woman and that's what we want to talk about. Even further, it makes her transphobia consumable and easy to dismiss. Someone whose horrific actions and problematic ideology is displayed in her Harry Potter books and the heinous people she supported all get ignored for the memeable, easily divisive reactions. Yeah, Rowling has nonsense Twitter drama with transgender YouTubers, but that's just it. Social media beef, not demonstrable harm to the transgender community. And even I fall into all of this because she is the best way to discuss these issues. It allows me to frame this discussion as something about this figure that people will pay attention to as opposed to about the systemic issues that we wish to talk about. She's made into nice, safe, easy consumable transphobia. Matt Walsh makes a transphobic documentary filled with tons of disinformation. We have to address it. Dave Chappelle lies in his special about his trans friend supposedly being bullied into suicide by the trans community, which he wasn't. We have to address that. We have to address his whole special. It becomes about him and talking about him and his platform and oh my gosh, he's being attacked so we need to support him. You will be able to see this movie in its entirety and you can see what they're trying to obstruct you from seeing. 
and you can judge for yourself, but you cannot have this conversation and exclude my voice from it. We need to go to a specials where you're gonna have Elon Musk there and all that crap. All the while, as the disinformation spreads, trans people continue to be harassed and nothing happens. It frustrates me because we can do so much more. It becomes about defending or attacking an individual, not about talking about the issues. We never get to have conversations beyond this. Do you know how much more we could talk about? There's so much more to explore at the intersections of identity and gender beyond simply consuming others' material. We could talk about exploring ourselves and who we are. Ideas that are not just relevant to trans people, but all humans as we learn how best to explore what it means to be human beyond the boundaries of what we are told we are meant to be, what we are told to consume. We could be so much more than we are talking about right now. Instead, we have to argue for the bare minimum. And that's all people see us as. I don't make this video because I wanted to go after Rowling. This isn't a problem with Rowling specifically, but how we talk about these issues constantly and how we consume who we support and continue to discuss enabling or not. Instead of dismantling privilege and fighting to stop all of us, not just trans people, from being seen as villains, lesser, or abnormal. This is why this video is titled my last video about Rowling. I'm sure I'll mention her in future videos, talk about things she does or will do, because sadly she is in a radicalization pipeline of gender critical thought that ultimately upholds fascism and she has become more and more focused on harming the trans community. She has the power to be able to do so. But I'm done making this about her, focused on her. Rolling is a symptom of the problem, not the problem itself. And this is something I've always known and felt. But this whole situation with Rowling just underscores its artifice for me. For a brief moment, a segment of the discourse that existed before me was centered upon me, and for that moment, I hoped, I hoped, I hoped, dear God, that I could share a message about how we can be more active. How Rowling is not only harming trans people, but all people by perpetuating transphobia. How transphobia is not an isolated problem affecting only trans people, but harms people of color, all women, LGBTQ folks, and more, and upholds the power of an already privileged few in a system that continually puts them in that position. Yet, by the time the conversation had moved beyond me, the discourse had only understood me in the way they wished me to be consumed and made me into the one-dimensional story consumable for the media market. I was reduced to a trans gamer in a big magazine, not a trans writer, advocate, or journalist. Trans gamer. That's all I am. And everyone thinks of me solely as the gamer who's had boycott rolling when I want to be so much more. I have spoken about much more than boycotting Harry Potter in fighting against hate. I have discussed creating a future where we don't live to consume, but where we live to explore ourselves, our identities, our communities, our universe. A universe of infinite diversity, infinite combinations, endless possibilities. And yet I am described as trans gamer, quickly understood and consumed by the few moments of attention I was given by the rays of J.K. Rowling's son. Yeah, and do you want me to go even further? Do you want me to become more self-aware? There is a reason that I, trans gamer Jesse Gender, got this attention. I'm the right kind of trans person, white, upper middle class. I had a platform built in part due to the privilege that I started with, mixed in with some hard work. Further, I respond to Rowling in precisely the right way. I had hoped my initial comments and responses would be kind, but one that pointed out Rowling's harm and drove people to deeper understanding of this systemic harm against trans community. But the main takeaway I saw many people take from my response to her was that, Jesse, you handled that with such grace, such poise. Many comments told me how great I handled it, how kindly. Even my peers were saying, Jesse, you are an angel, so kind, the best kind of person, the Miss Rogers of trans people. And you know what? I like that. It's who I want to be but it became about me. Me versus Rolling. I responded the right way, with jokes about PlayStation 2, Hagrid, and Windows XP. As if there's a right way to have people openly debate your right to be treated like a human being and a right way to respond to it. I know how this elevated attention on me, and attention is power, as I said. J.K. Rowling, for a brief moment, put me on her level. My platform grew. I got many more followers on Twitter and YouTube. I can see the dots ahead of me of growing more and more and more. One million YouTube subscribers, baby! I'm on my goddamn way! The intention economy roulette has paid out to Jesse Jenner because I played the game correctly and I could use this power. I could use it for good. I could help so many people with it. As long as it's about me. When all I want to do in all of this is scream. Scream every day at the way trans people are treated. Scream at the top of my lungs how I hate having to argue for my basic existence. How everything I've described to you in this video just makes me so upset and angry and I just want to yell. I want to scream and curl up in a ball and be done. I want to hug every Harry Potter thing I own and say that you can have it. It was mine first. It meant this to me. I also want to take everything I own with Harry Potter on it and destroy it as violently as I can. I want to yell because these are two feelings that are completely irreconcilable and yet live within me every day. 
I want to be able to listen to Harry Potter audiobooks before I go to bed because they were my comfort and allowed me to sleep when I suffered deep insomnia. I want to scream about how I hate this woman for doing this and how I can't ever move beyond it sometimes. I hate how much I have had to explain and argue with you and make this so overlong video over and over and over again to just argue with you to not actively give fucking money to someone who helps further the death of trans people. I just want to scream about all of it. But I don't. I am the friendly Jesse. I make videos about J.K. Rowling with approachable jokes about PS2 Hagrid and Windows XP. I must be careful to be consumed the right way. Because if I'm not, it could be used against me. Even that moment of anger and rage I just showed you right now, which is how many trans people feel, will probably be taken out of context and used as evidence of my male socialization and privilege. Look at Jesse, just raging like a man. In actuality, I just express the rage inside every trans person, every marginalized person. But we're told to be quiet, demure, not express ourselves. It's not the right way. In contrast, those in power can rage about any perceived slight to their bottom line with impunity. On national TV, their next Netflix comedy special, or their next Warner Brothers movie deal. But that's what anti-trans people will always do. They'll always find that about me. They'll find it about any marginalized person. They'll find the dirt. They'll find the imperfections. Because in truth, I'm not pure or perfect or an angel. Maybe I get it right every once in a while. I try my best and I try my best to listen and to grow and to try to be open to criticism, but I'm not perfect. I will try to help and fight for those harmed, but it's important to know that as an individual, I can never be perfect because if people believe and consume me that way, then I'll be able to insulate myself with my privilege. I'll be grandized as an individual and I won't be able to hear the voices of those who are trying to point out where I do make mistakes, where I do cause harm. Well, maybe I'll say something dumb, say a silly thing on Twitter that will be over-scrutinized or taken by bad faith actors and drawn out of proportion because trans people or any marginalized people take extra scrutiny. Hell, this isn't exclusive to trans people. Like I said, it's any marginalized person. There's a reason that we talk about JK Rowling's transphobia and videos about her transphobia do better than ones on Tarko Carlson's harm. How the attention economy is much more focused on bringing her down Tucker Carlson and Rowling both cause harm against the trans community, but Carlson is expected. He even has a bigger platform, and yet we don't talk about him as much. Rowling was a betrayal, and she's a woman. Isn't it interesting that we focus on the woman more than the man who's causing more harm, potentially? But even beyond that, even beyond that sort of option, maybe one day I will, like Rowling, cause actual harm with my platform because I've reached a place of so much privilege that I don't see those who are beneath me now. My failure will be taken not only as a personal failure, but a failure of all trans people. I am a bad one, and really aren't all trans people like that? Hysterical, over the top, ridiculous. And I'll disappear, lose my platform, go away. Or maybe if I'm feeling willing to sell my morals, to be self-interested, hold on to what I earned, what I deserve, I could double down on my mistake, claiming I'm being canceled. Garner hate-filled audiences who care about the cult of my personality over what I've had to say in the first place. Cause I was perfect, pure, the best. And I continue to sell my merch. I can see the prophecy now, the chosen one. It doesn't matter who the chosen one is, just who is chosen. Individual who can take on the system and become part of it in the process becomes about me, not the issues I wanted to discuss, and thus the system continues. Meanwhile, as we all focus on this hypothetical me or the real JK Rowling's or Dave Chappelle or insert problematic celebrity here, anti-trans legislation continues to be passed. Trans people continue to die being left out of needed healthcare or simply discriminated against by our doctors for everyday illnesses. We are continually vilified, leading to mass mental health stresses and suicidal thoughts in our community. Trans people repeatedly get slurred as groomers. Trans people die and are murdered by active shooters coming into our communities and gunning us down. But we don't change anything because we are fighting over our cult of celebrity, which allows us to just focus on fighting for the bare minimum. I mean, goddamn, J.K. Rowling made the Gender Recognition Act in Scotland controversial. It was a law that was just about making it easier to change your gender marker. It wasn't healthcare reform, it wasn't basic trans rights protections, it was a gender marker reform. That got controversial. And not saying that we shouldn't do it, but god, we have so many more fights that we need to fight than that. And yet that's what she makes it all about. Hell, even as I was making this video, the gender marker reform bill passed in Scotland, but was overturned by the UK government. A simple bill that would allow the bare minimum of allowing trans people to just have an easier time with documents was attacked by the UK government, overriding the will of the Scottish government. 
This after months of gender-critical feminists arguing that the bill would let men sneak into women's spaces, despite other countries having the same exact law on the books and that never happening, and the bill in Scotland would require someone to live as their gender for six months before getting to change their documents. It's a lot of work for a predatory man to do when he can just walk into a woman's space. It just shows how the gender critical movement tries to make even the smallest of trans rights issues a controversial topic and the growing right wing segment of the UK government as well as governments in other countries using the words of these gender critical movements to make the topic of basic rights controversial so they can justify overturning the democracy of the people. And thereby trans people asking for the bare minimum and gender critical people themselves yelling about trans people are just being used as pawns in a game to justify authoritarianism. This is how all trans people in our stories are consumed, the cycle we are put into, either as villains in an anti-trans story or pitiable, victimized people asking for the bare minimum of not perpetuating harm against us. And with those being the only narratives people hear about us, harm against us continues, and worse, because even the bare minimum is up for debate. <laughs> it's no wonder Rowling only sees the boogie trans person. It's all she can see from her high tower, the only paper delivered to her by an owl. I'm the serious black and her daily prophet, staring back at her screaming like a madman, never getting to know the real person who fights for others reflected in those images. And on the other side, we fight for trans rights, but continually fall into a similar trap, focusing our energy on rolling without realizing that she's a pawn, a Dolores Umbridge, a symptom of a systemic problem that defeating Voldemort will not stop unless we stop the system itself, unless we tear down the ministry. And so I leave you all with this. Thank you for watching this video, but know that there's so much more to do. We can do so much more. We can fight so much more. The choices we have are not consuming or not consuming. It's a false dichotomy. I don't think you should buy Hogwarts Legacy, but I honestly don't care as much about that as I do everything else. I don't want to be a simple consumer. I want to see what we can become when we don't always cater to the lowest common denominator of hatred when we have conversations beyond hate. I want to explore the vastness of human identity that lies beyond what we can buy. I want to conceptualize ideas that we have forgotten the language for. I want to find the real magic that the human experience can encompass. We can be, we can know, we can explore so much more. We can feel so much more. But we need to do it together, to work together and understand each other through our own words, not someone else's filtering them for us. All this cis women versus trans women that J.K. Rowling and gender critical feminist soak doesn't serve trans people or women generally or anybody, except for those in power. In fact, it harms all of us. It's an endless decay into fascism. Community, caring, solidarity, active support, not just passively consuming. That's how we create a better world. Because trans rights can only exist in a world that is equal for everyone. That is where the real magic begins. So, um, apologies for the low-key vibe right now. Uh, I had another outro here after the credits that was meant to be a much more, you know, sort of bigger ending. Um, but watching it after everything that you just saw and editing this video, I hated the outro um, for several different reasons. Uh, to be honest, I shot it initially after shooting the entire rest of the video. Like, I shot everything and then shot that right after. And... I was kind of in emotional tatters at the end there for obvious reasons. Um, even more so because I actually had a production mishap during the video and I had to reshoot the like middle chunk of the video uh, twice actually. So um, I got really just uh, emotionally and physically exhausted at the end there. Being honest, I'm actually not entirely uh, happy with my delivery at the end. Uh, of the video, but to be frank with you, I was just kind of dead uh, at the end there. 
Um, so yeah, I was just, uh, I was really ready to just be, be done filming uh, at that point for again, hopefully very clear reasons. Anywho, the outro that I initially shot where I did the usual like and subscribe thing, I was just kind of like dead. I was just kind of like, like and subscribe to the thing. Um, so you're getting this moment instead because I wanted to, to reshoot that. Because I did have a couple quick things that I wanted to really say before I wrap this out um, to just talk about. The very first thing that I want to say, because it is probably the most important, is I want to give a shout out to Aranok. I'm sure all of you remember her section of this video, and it was uh, it was rough for me to watch uh, and edit that section of the video because she's a friend and someone that I care about. But also, she expressed the feeling that I and so many trans people feel about this entire situation in a really raw way. Um, believe me, if you're not trans, know that what Aranok shared in that section of the video was something that every trans person has experienced on some level. I experienced it over Christmas and the exact emotions that she showed all of you were the emotions that were fueling the writing of this script. And Aranok made herself really vulnerable uh, in that moment and shared it all with you in a very real way. She didn't do that scripted, she literally sat down and, and sent that to me because she felt that she wanted to say that in this video and I wanted to give her the platform to do so. So please send her some love, um, especially since I know both of us for putting out this video will probably get even more crap sent our way. I am sure I'm going to have a really fun comment section and, and, and Twitter platform the next week or so. Now, it's fine with me. I don't care about me. Uh, I'll be okay, uh, but I will fight to the death for Aranok. Um, as much as I will fight to the death for every other trans person out there because I want to try to protect the people that I love and care about as, as much as I can. So please send her some love and support. Go support her and subscribe to her channel. Um, she was also, by the way, completely separately just recognized by the freaking BFI for her queer temporality video and it's freaking amazing so you shouldn't miss it. Like, go watch that video right now. Speaking on that though, and videos that inspired me, as I said at the start of this entire thing, I am done making videos about hate. Do not get me wrong, I am still going to do videos fighting back and pushing back against bigotry. Uh, I think that's important to do, especially considering the age we are all in, not only with trans stuff, but with many other fights going on simultaneously right now in the United States and around the world. Um, but from here on out, I want to be making content that feels more fulfilling and not just draining every single time I get the video out. I've done that a few times this past uh, year or so and it's it's not sustainable. So I'm going to be working with Aranok and several other of my trans and queer collaborators like my friend Lucian who helped edit this video. By the way, thank you Lucian who is also amazing to focus on things that inspire me. In the next two months, I have two videos that are a little bit lower key and fun that I'm finishing up. Uh, believe me, one's kind of out there. Uh, but then I have some really big projects uh, beginning around March, April-ish uh, that I think are going to really blow you away. I am very pumped about them and excited about them, uh, and you all should be too. Uh, Aranok's working on them, and beyond that too, I'm going to tease this a little bit here as I said at the beginning of the video, I have a really a really big project outside of YouTube that I'm going to uh, officially announce next video, or next big video, I should say, in February. Um, you know what's great? Um, you've watched three and a half hours of this video, I'll just tell you right now, if you're if you're in this long, I'll just say, I'm making a short film. Um, it's gonna be really cool. I'm, I'll wait till next month to like tell you all what it's about and who's working on it, because it's gonna be kind of fun. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna be working on that and I'll tell you more information next month. Don't tell the normies in the comments about it. Um, so just wait, but I'm very, very pumped about it. All of these videos and the things that I'm focusing on for this year are being inspiring to remind us all that we should all have hope in the future, especially if we're trans and queer right now because the world seems so dark for many of us. I've seen so many and gotten so many messages from people saying they feel really lost and scared and alone. Um, and I'm glad to fight for us, but I want us all to remember too that there is hope and that hope is in each other. And this is the final point that I'll end on because we live in a capitalist society, yay! Um, 
because even when I do reactive content like this, because I know this video is going to do decently well despite the length of it, considering the topic and the person it's on, um, which again, frustrating. Um, but even when I do reactive content like this, as I found out while I was doing test uploads of this video, I'm going to get no monetization on this video from YouTube. So I did all this work. Um, Aranok made herself vulnerable. I wrote what I wrote um, and tried to make myself vulnerable as well. Um, and this video isn't going to help me pay my bills in the slightest. YouTube doesn't help me at all, and it's honestly scary and frustrating, um, which is why I've only been able to get to this point, and I'm only going to be able to do all the things that I want to do because of all of you and the help I've received. So thank you to all of my patrons who are supporting me in doing this. Earnestly and honestly, thank you. Um, and I want to thank Nebula as well, who have been amazing in supporting me behind the scenes, doing this video and on other things that I'm working on. Um, and sorry for doing the, hey, remember the ad thing. But seriously, if you do want to support me on Nebula, it does help. So check out that link that's below. Um, I know it's the frustrating capitalism thing, uh, but supporting me on Patreon and Nebula uh, really does help me. And I hope I make it worth your money. And I promise you that I would not be saying and asking these things if it didn't um, help me pay my bills and support me doing cool stuff. And I try to pass that along to other people that I work with. Uh, as well. And also, you get me talking about Scotty Bats and Nebula and Patreon too, so if you, who doesn't love Scotty Bats? Who doesn't love Scotty Bats? Um, anyways, thank you for indulging me in that. Thank you for allowing me to focus on making cool things. Thank you for allowing me the chance to hopefully move beyond stupid videos like this one. Um, if I make the world a smidge brighter or help someone, uh, I know it was worth it. Um, you've made it worth it for me. So for now, thank you. I know this was rough. Send love to Aranok and any trans person in your life if you're a cis person. Uh, and know that everything I talked about in this was rough, but we do have each other and we do have a future. We just have to make it together. Not in spite of people like Rowling, but for ourselves. Leaving her behind. Because she isn't worth it. The hate she makes should be fought against and then forgotten. Because we have so, so many bigger things to do. It is 20 freaking 23, everybody. Holy crap. Uh, I have been doing this job for several years now as a full-time job, uh, and I cannot thank you all enough for allowing me to do that. Like, every one of you patrons out there, I would not be able to do this as my job. I would not be able to do any of this without all of you. So thank you so much for your beautiful support and your continued support. Newt, who is crawling into the room right now, uh, also says thank you because you literally feed him. You feed my cat. Newt says thank you. So uh, with that said, I an extra special thank you to Kathleen Beth, Joe Herman Holt, Carrie Ellen Foss, Miranda Janelle, Lily Gray, Ong Weas, Heather Long, El Titivi, Dark Excalibur 42, Barbie Ann Rounds, Jack McCallan, Stephen Kleinard, Quartro, Jam Shin, Corchin Ray Kelly, Barbara Ruski, Matt Chung, Ali Gobert, Super Desi, Randy Thompson, Mary Mello, Alan Altman, Smooky Heather Sylvia, Britz Krieg, Wellington Marcus, Zach Cody, Meadow Whisperer, Boyd Mary Beth Earl, Vincent Ellington, Lily Blaley, Joseph Dewey, Chloe Dollar, Felicia Toss, Liz Yabeth, Chris. Christensen, James Krivda, Zany Schulster, Dominic Noble, Rose Connolly, Gordon Alexander, Jennifer Fuss, Weirdy Beardy, love that name, Chris Bodie, Dinnick, Andy with an I, Sunk Corgi, Sean McKenzie, Sonia Naropardo, Nathaniel Fronton, Hellscape Wanderer, Jolene Cassidy, Eric Kanak, Farrow Rangito, Mag Mag, Transit Toronto, Rain Corky, Anthony Stewart, Spencer Brownlee, Wendell Zabizzle, Pan the Fabulous Ferret, Sasha M, Ryan Hunter, Dwayne L, Stephen Richardson, W. Randy Eady, Kalari Uraro, Damian Rice, Melinda Walters, Drew Bach, Carrie On, Shield Maiden 4444, Tang Wilson, Sag Corbett, John Witherby, Autumn Jennings, Kevin Frotek, Zach Prax, Cyber Quaker. Nissia Mayer, Fox E, Beatrix Purvis, Lysa, Sean Piper, Maddie H, Flynn, Melody Ann, Winter's Good, Devin Camerlocker, Flying Canadia Dragon, Mark H. Williams, Author, Epsilon is Greater Than, Casual Observer, Sarah Bystem, Gretchen Badger, Jordan Long, Patricia Kronz, Katie K, Blueberry Hill, William Stewart, Mary and Her, Michael and Katie Hack, Sarah Lamoro, The Mighty Jinjo Joe, uh -huh. Nathan Steele, Sarah Ledgley Hutchkins, Laura Demereaux, Chris Hurst, Kathy's Caser, Julia Sweeney, Verdict Sky, Sky Skinner, Jess Johnson, Leah Tha Boyd, Jason Knott, Zemuli Kincaid, Becky Sparks, Joe Here Six, M Sophos, Troy Stall, Blue, the Tipsy Changeling, Maeve Teresa, Luna T, Kurt Mullen, Jordy Lucero, Tony the DC Nerd, Celestial Dawn, Strawberry Pop Tart, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Crit Fax, Grumpy Dragon 75, Kalis, Angie Pugh, Adam Ardiel Taylor, Alexander Lombach, Barbara Borges, It's a Bug, Not a Feature, Uruk Bogdan, Unicorn Floof, Abigail Marie, James Hodge, Corey and Vale, Honkinen. Thank you again for allowing. 
allowing me to do all this. Thank you so much for just being wonderful and amazing. And thank you for feeding Newt. Uh, we both thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. You beautiful, beautiful people.